any 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 um, academic English study is going to be different than yes yeah. how you look at it. <coughs> it's just like <coughs> the Arabic like you can right, study life. you can study modern standard Arabic but when you go to a country it's just entirely different mm. you're not really going to understand yeah. what locals are saying Face. Yeah, thanks for the comment, buddy. <laughs> it's a compliment, yeah. Face is nice. It's very strange. Yeah, you have very nice face. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mom Luke. So my name is Sim. Along with me is my co-host, Sheikh Hamer. Assalamu alaikum. And the one and only, Mort. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, folks, we have a wonderful show for you guys this afternoon. But please, uh, before we get started, go, go ahead and click on that like button. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. And throw a comment in the comment section below with your thoughts related to this show. And uh, how good we look. Or how good, what an inspiration Sheikh Hamar is. Or how too. handsome our, our guest is going to be, inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. Our guest today is a man who <laughs> is a uh, Mamluk uh, historian. He's uh, uh, an academic of, uh, or he, he didn't like the term I was calling him, by he corrected me. But uh, he, he is someone who specializes in uh, Shafi Islamic jurisprudence. Um, a man who uh, we're really excited to have on board uh, on, on the show today, Arash Tawakoli. Tawakol Allah is a term that one of our friends used to say. <laughs> Tawakoli, for those who don't know, Tawakol means f- trust in Allah. I, I'm trust that your name is in that origin. <laughs> well, yes. Tawak- we, had, we, had, we had a brother we grew up with. He would speed through tolls, like he wouldn't pay the toll. <laughs> And he would say, Tawakul Allah, brother. Hey, and he'd be going like 200 kilometers per hour. And I'm like, yo, we're, we're going to be, because we had a sheikh who, who wouldn't let us through the door if we were like 15 minutes late. There was like a 15 minute bu- buffer zone. And if you didn't make it on, on time, you're just shut out. You're locked out. So he would say, Tawakul Allah. <laughs> and so that's what I thought of when I saw your last name. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. I'm not that kind, but happy to be here. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Alaikum <laughs> Salaam. Can you welcome. bring the microphone a little closer to you? Oh, yes. Mic, yes. yes. Arash is as well a uh, the founder of Mizan Way. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the Mizan Way? Okay. To the first thing, so I'm not a professor yet. <laughs> I didn't have. You're a doctor. Yeah. I'm, doctor I'm, means professor, Yoshi. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the title. So I didn't have the opportunity to lecture yet, but maybe I do today. So I got it, the title granted from the Met Mamluks, which is which is an honor. But okay. uh, yeah, I'm on the fourth year of my PhD program, and I do research uh, on uh, Mamluk uh, periods, uh, especially the Shafi fiqh, the Shafi madhab. And so, if, you, if I can pause you, yeah. there, what do you mean by the Mamluk period and Shafi? You mean the Shafi fiqh? Also within the Mamluk period? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, or? yes. So what I'm doing in my research is, so my PhD is about two, uh, the end of the 15th century, century mm-hmm. and the beginning of the 16th century, which was like the last years of the Mamluks because they got took over by the Ottomans, 1516 in Sham and 1517 in Cairo, mm. so that was it. And uh, two <coughs> jurists I'm concerned with are uh, Sheikh Islam Zakaria Al Ansari and Jalaluddin As Suyuti. Subhanallah. Yes, and they uh, died respectively 1520, Ansari 1520, and Suyuti 1505. So that's the topic, and yeah, inshallah, maybe one day I get a professorship. But uh, what I'm doing now, yes, it's the Mizan way. You can see it here in English and Arabic, and you see the scales. So oh, it's sure. all about uh, striking a balance. Um, all people speak about the uh, life, work, sleep balance. But uh, what I'm concerned with is the uh, mind, soul, and physique balance, which is what all of Islam is about, in my opinion. If you see just the five pillars of Islam, yeah. if you look at it, it strikes this balance. And it's not easy nowadays, I would say. It's not easy because of uh, the modern way of life and so on. So it's a um, lifestyle thing. Mm. 
and I just launched it. I just dropped a new video. Check it out. It's on YouTube. Mizan Way. The only difference is with a double A. So you have to write M I Z A A N and then Way with a space between. Mm. And it's the same on Insta, yes. And you're living it too. You run marathons. You recently just ran a marathon yesterday. Yes, yes. With I, uh, only three weeks of training because you had bronchitis. Yes, yes, <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. I work out. I, I run. I do a lot of calisthenics and body weight practice. Every day I lost about... I, I didn't used to be that way, but alhamdulillah. So I, I, I lived this lifestyle now for like five or six months. I lost about 55 pounds. Oh, wow. wow. Yes, alhamdulillah. Wow. wow. You were a fatty? You were a fatty. I was. <laughs> Straightforward. Bro, Iconics. you don't know. Me yeah. and uh, Mizan, yeah, yeah. we're friends now. No, no, I know. I'm just yes. saying. I have proofs. I have the pictures. Yeah, I no, was. I mean, no, we I was, talk I about that. I was a that. real sheikh then. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we talk a lot about that too because, you know, like um, a lot of guys, especially you get start getting older, you need muscle. So I've been kind of dragging him. I had to drag him to the gym on Monday. I'm like, come on. Lift some weights, right? How you feeling, by the way? You good? Feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm you know, no pain, pain, nothing. No you pain, good. All right, yeah. Enough. But a lot of guys, you know, just get older and fat and lazy. And I'm not thinking after especially be after marriage. Are you a family man, Mizan? Yeah. You married? I'm still Arash. I'm not Mizan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Arash. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about Mizan way now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dope name though. Let's call him Mizan. Yeah, yeah. Mizan, Mizan is good. We have no, you, you should, you should, you should uh, keep with that because it will also promote you. Yeah, promote. Yeah, yeah. 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 call him Mizan. <laughs> Mizan is the worst thing. Mizan. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Anyways, yeah, just yeah. breaking that. So, are you a family man? Is what he asked. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Yes, I would say. I would say yes. Oh, you're married now, mashallah. I was. Oh, okay. oh, 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 sorry. Th yeah, that's yeah. how I lost it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now you know the whole story. Well, well that's a great motivation. Well, welcome weight, to the club. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I know about that. Yeah, We all know about Sim. It's okay. We yeah, all know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Don't get into it, Sim. I didn't want to reveal because you yeah. know. Yeah. My my DM is gonna be full now, but yeah. 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 Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. everything happens for a reason, brother. Yes, yes, yes. But if you that was not planned, by the way. Yeah. If you want someone. But the babies or. No, <laughs> me, you asking me this. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Man. So if you uh, if you want someone to filter through your DM, Sim is happy to do that. He likes to, yeah, he likes to match, you know, match. He'll be the wall. Together. He'll be the wall yeah. of protection. Um, you know, okay, let's, let's some let's call it a humanitarian let's change the topic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let, yeah. Let's go to the Mamluks. Let's yeah, yeah. yeah. Mamluks. So, no. so wait, wait, hold on, wait, 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 real quickly. So, so a little bit about you. People want to know who you are too, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So, so. You're, uh, you said you, you moved to Germany when you were five years old, yes. right? Where are you from originally? Yes, I'm born in Iran. What okay, what part of Iran? Uh, in the city of Isfahan. 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 Hey, uh, okay, by the way, hold on, sorry to interrupt you here. Before people get ideas, because you know there's a hadith about Isfahan, right? So people, get, you know, all people all, and you know, let's be honest here. Among Sunnis, right, there's this notion that everybody from Iran is just anti-Sunni. I'm going to realize that 30% of the country is still Sunni. Yes. Especially among the Baloch and Ahwaz and Bandar Abbas and these areas, yes. even from different areas. So why don't you talk about that first? Because people don't have no idea that there are Iranian Sunnis. Yeah, I can tell you a lot about this. So, uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, I was born in Iran, in Isfahan, uh, 1990. So I'm 30, uh, 33 years old now. Mm -hmm. And we migrated to Germany by the age of five. I lived in Germany my whole life, and then uh, with 21, I returned for five more years mm -hmm. to Iran. So I also lived as an adult in Iran. But I have also some memories growing up. I know one time I was uh, playing in the street, and then I um, turned just to the, to the corner, to the next street, and then I saw a bunch of people dressed in black. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, yani, let me out. They were hitting themselves. They're yeah. hitting, yeah. hitting them, hitting themselves and crying and weeping, and I was really intimidated. I was really scared from from this impression. It never left me. So this was my first <laughs> impression of, of of Shiite Islam. Okay. So wait, hold on, hold on. So wait, that things add up. So wait a minute, hold on, hold on. So in your life in Isfahan, you didn't really see too much like. Um, prominent to show you like meaning like people make oh. let me uh, or okay okay I, I was like three okay, okay. you gotta so keep it a mic buddy okay <laughs> yeah. yeah so i was like three years old then yeah. so um 
I may have seen, but I have no memories of that. And this, I have it because it was so uh, like extreme, f- yeah, threatening to mm-hmm. me. So and it stuck to my mind. But uh, answering a question though, um, no. My, so I gr- I come from a, a secular family, and I would say that applies now. It applies to ninety five percent of Iranians. Wow. Yeah. So what 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 happened is that people slowly but surely uh they left islam altogether yeah. practice wise but not just practice wise also belief wise and mm-hmm. they don't identify with it yeah so how many how many like what's the level of agnosticism or atheism like in iran right now I, I would say the most thing in iran the most common thing in iran having lived in iran and spoken to people in university and mm-hmm. off campus on campus and so on i would say the most common thing is deism especially older generation mm. is deism among young ones like gen z and stuff i think there's a decent amount of atheists but more so agnostic i see but but most of the people are deists and these deists some of them are have a better relation with islam some of them don't but Aqida wise <laughs> there's not much left to be honest so if you strictly define the definition uh, define the religion sorry as believing in Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the rest, uh, la- last messenger and believing uh, uh, the 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 entire uh, to the entirety of the Quran the whole Quran with all its verses and stuff yeah you, you, yeah, yeah very so so just for the listeners who don't know deism is basically the idea that there's a god he created everything but he's independent of the world yeah, he doesn't really have any he left everything to do as it is so you have you can make your own destiny you can do whatever you want to do there's just a creator um that's really really interesting and it, you know what to be honest like a lot, a lot a lot of times people think that we have this animosity towards the rain and it's not really even that i think traditionally if you look back especially people from our background there's a close connection to Persia and Iran, oh, yeah. like not yes. just. I mean, it's, it's our scholars and our language. I mean, anyone who speaks Urdu, people don't even know. Even Hindi derived the same time from Urdu. There's a heavy influence of Persian. Like my mother speaks Persian. My my grandfather, they, they yeah, wrote in Persian. They yeah. they. Yes. This is how they studied. This was the what they called Logat Diwan, right? It was the 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 language of the courts. You couldn't get by. You were uneducated if you didn't know Persian. The Franca lingua, yes. Right. Yes. You were. And no, not even that. The whole Muslim Ummah is like proud of and you know rightfully brags about the days of Baghdad and Kufa and and then the Persians and the scholars. Euphrates River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, the scholarship. Like, furthermore, I mean, just the number of scholars that came out. I mean, the, the name we don't have to name them, but they're endless, right? Yeah. I mean, yes. from the books of a hadith yeah, to the hadith fifth, yeah. I mean, yeah. Tirmidhi, it's even Arabic, day. Arabic yeah. grammar. So yeah. that's another thing I want to say too. The Arabs knew how to speak Arabic because it was within their language, but it was only until after Persia was conquered where they had to now have a population that needed to learn the lang- learn the language, right? But since the Persians already had a system of language, they were the ones able to come up with the structure of Nahu. So if they would name these things, intricate engineering, yeah, I mean yeah. Sibawe, for example. Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, a master of the Arabic, a grammarian, right? Yeah. Everyone depends on him. You have to if yeah. you study the language, right? But uh, what I'm saying is that they took what they had as a civilization and they applied it to help Islam grow, and that's why we have a lot of works come out of Persia. Right, exactly. even beyond just what you know with Iran, Bukhara, Samarkand, all these areas to Khuzestan, these areas that you have that were traditionally what we call Persian or Persia, yeah. right? They have a huge Persian influence. controlled, right? Exactly, Persian controlled, a yes. huge influence, and and uh, we are indebted to a lot of the people that came from that area, right? The yeah. work they did, of course. One one really interesting thing I like to find out, like about yourself, just on a personal level. I hope you don't mind talking about it. Is uh, People from Iran generally and from, you know, some parts of Iraq are generally Hanafi, right? But you specialize in Shafi, in Shafi fiqh in your... So that's that's a cool dynamic to understand how that comes about, right? Because you have all types of people go and live in a certain land and they change their madhab. Like that happened with Imam mm-hmm. al-Tahawi, mm-hmm. rahimahullah, right? Yes. His uncle, Imam al-Muzani, was one of the heads of the Shafi. Uh, his mother, Imam al-Tahawi's <coughs> mother, was a Shafi. But then he switched. There's all these theories, but the original story we know. But what's your story? I mean, were you born as a Shafi'i? Were you, you know? Okay. And we're not with us. We don't care about, like, we're not going to make a big <laughs> deal. We're not going to hate you if you're another mother. We don't care about that. But I, I, I just want to know. It's a cool dynamic because it's going to play a role in, in your research, yes. obviously. Yes, yes, it does. So uh, it's a good jump. 
but just summing the 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 part before that up so i grew up less like most iranians secular mm. but me personally i grew up with turks and arabs i see mm. and i loved the relationship turks and arabs had to their religion mm. to islam and also to their cultural identity they were not hiding away from it persians would that's why persians call themselves persians mm. in the first place they don't call themselves iranians because iran would more refer to the state and the government and also the history and islam that's how they think at least Interesting. and persian is just the ethnic thing you know and it's not just that i i knew a lot of my family was not like that but i knew a lot of iranian families the parents would tell their kids not to speak persian publicly they would forbid them why because they would they were embarrassed of being not european mm. oh yes and side. they would they would prefer to speak with a very 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 weird and cringe uh, accent in german <laughs> instead of speaking uh, with their kids wow outside instead of speaking their their mother language they would speak persian it uh, causes attention it's yeah it causes yeah, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were like this so inferior complex you know and also if you if you look at some iranian women you you, you see it from the looks also you know and but but um having said that i grew up culturally and i know a lot about iranian culture and we went to uh weekend school like what uh, Sunday school Sunday yeah. school yeah yeah, yeah. so it, it's on Saturday so <laughs> I didn't want to lie so <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's too. the fiqh you know yeah. 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 <laughs> but how did that formation happen you were with the Turks and the Arabs so how did that form you like, what, so, what, so what it, was that? always I had this good feeling about Islam and I was proud about being Muslim and I knew most Iranians weren't and this is in Germany by and this way. in Germany this yeah. bef before I became practicing yeah, yeah. then I uh, that then we moved from a, a minor city to Hamburg Hamburg, where, where, where I grew up eventually, uh, at the age of 15. Is that, is that where your university is from? Yeah. <laughs> Hamburg? He's going to say Hamburg University. Ha I that's where Sheikh Harbour is studying from. I knew it. Sheikh Harbour is studying from Hamburg <laughs> University. That's what I eat every day. Anyway, I know he was, I was thinking like Oak Brook, yeah. but anyways, go ahead. That's the headquarters of McDonald's, that's why. Yeah, no, you don't say Hamburg University, you say University of Hamburg. Mm. Oh, okay? Okay. 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 That's the solution. <laughs> You know? Anyway, sorry, bro. In fiqh, there are always <laughs> there are always <laughs> solutions, you know. So uh, yeah, so I, I I got to know some some brothers, and they took me to the masjid. It was really funny because um, later on, seeing the Risala movie, mm -hmm. uh, it was this uh, uh, moment that uh, happened with with Hamza. The you message, know? the movie, the message. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, where where he said, "Tashtumuhu uh, wa ana ala dine." Uh, so, so, so Abu Lahab would uh, uh, curse the Prophet وسلم, and Hamza heard it and then said just out of reaction, okay, out of pride for his, for his nephew, do you uh, curse him and I'm on his religion? And he was not. But later on he considered it. And that's, uh, so I had this moment because uh, we were playing football and they wanted to go to the mosque. But they thought, okay, this this Iranian secular guy, Shiite, Shiite guy, he won't ca come with us. And we would do everything together. But that moment they got it and said, okay, let's meet at the bus station in half an hour. And I said, where are you going? We're going to the mosque. Why don't you tell me? I'm, I'm more Muslim than all of you. <laughs> <Allah>. <laughs> yes. And then I went and... Um, I, I never uh, I never you had the Hamza moment. I Allah 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 Allah. Allah. You never look back. I never look back. And some yeah. of those guys didn't come uh, later so on. They just ca uh, came once. <laughs> 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 and alhamdulillah, that's that's uh, that's how I got religious and practicing. And for me, about one year, I was figuring out Shia or Sunni and stuff, because we would go like occasionally to this, you know, Latmiat. So how yeah, how yeah. Do you call yeah, it's like the beating. The, be uh, the beating self stuff, self flagellation. Yeah, yeah self flagellation yeah. stuff and so <laughs> yeah. like Muharram and yeah. stuff. Ashura, Matam, Matam is the name, right? Matam, Matam. Yeah, Matam. Yeah, that's a type of. Yeah, that's a type, it's a type of, of. Yeah, but but, but yeah. one question I have is: yeah. were, Was your family culturally were they Shia or Sunni back in Iran? Uh, Shia, Shia, Shia. Okay, got it. Yeah, Shia, yeah. it's fun. It's fun. But, it's but, fun but, is like the epic center yeah, of yeah. Safavis, you know. When you say, but when you say, I can say culturally, it just means pretty much that. Oh, they would say Ya Ali or sometimes, yes. or they would just go to yes. Muharram or Ashura, yes. and they not would much just, practicing. Yeah, that that's pretty although, much. It. Although my, my mother, my mother, just to be just, 
My mother used to pray mm -hmm. when we was very uh, s uh, small, but later on she didn't do that. And uh, one thing, uh, fasting is not a thing among Shias. There are people praying, religious people praying, but they don't fast. You have the other, f other side around with the Sunnis. And I have to say here, Islam-wise, what the Shia make makes more sense. Because we know in Islam, yeah. prayer is more important than, than, than fasting. But I know culturally, Sunnis, growing up with Sunnis, they would do everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. most criminal, so, but they would fast. And f not fasting was like kufr for them. Yeah. You know? But you know, I wanted to ask you though, because um, That's Germany, culture. Yeah, no, but Germany also is a very unique place because it, a lot of Turks went to Germany yes. at the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I mean, they started migrating there. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, th there, there is a, I mean, I, I, I could be wrong here, but I've heard that a lot of the Turks there are also pretty secular as well too in Germany. Yes. The, look, uh, I would say most uh, Turks didn't went immediately after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Uh, it was more like in the 60s, early 60s, mid 60s. And they called them in Germany, they, they used to call them uh, Gastarbeiter, which means like guest workers, oh. which is a label <laughs> which lets you know, just do the work and then return. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but they didn't return. And uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they they were guests who <laughs> they're gas, they're <laughs> gaslighters. Yes, yes. So, uh, but uh, it's very interesting. I would say Turks, and not just me. A lot of Turks share th this opinion. Turks in Germany are more religious than the average Turk in Turkey. Wow. And you will see that if you if you travel to Germany and then compare to traveling, it depends also where you go in Turkey. Of course, it's a big country, but on average why is that because most of these guest workers that came in the 60s and 70s and so on came from the region of anatolia mm -hmm. and anatol and there's one it's it's not a conspiracy it's, it's like a anal uh, uh, like a, a opinion uh, that at that time the turkish government also wanted to get rid of those so mm. they, they, they made a contract with Germany because Germany was negotiating also with Iran, I know that, uh, and some other countries uh, of the region because after World War, they were lacking manpower, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of men died in, in Germany. Yeah. And you had also problem with re reproducing, you know, and uh, also working. So... That's that's a theory that is out there. I don't know, but anyway. So I would say no. Uh, most people, even though now they are in third generation, some are in fourth generation now. Most people still, especially the Turks, they 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 uh, they remained their uh, or they carried their Turkish identity, the language, and also to 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 a high amount the the religiosity. I would say yeah. Well, how co say. how come the brothers from Germany? are so quiet like we hear uk brothers pretty loud you see all kinds of different um their just social media presence pretty uh, established what's the difference between german muslims despite there being so many of them uh there being plenty of them that are practicing as you just said why why are they kind of toned down in there i got you i got you yeah so i would say um if, if you have a scale of Muslim activism in, in Europe, I would say uh, the ones scoring the most in the top are the UK, obviously. They are the most active. They are even more active than, than you guys are, yeah, I way, would say, way yes. More. 100%. But, but I, have to, I, have to, I have to give you flowers here. So I was, I was in LA before coming here and I was in UCLA on the campus and I was really surprised positively from the MSA, the organization. Uh, so so you, you are really good, established also. You, you have to see, th those people that came from uh, Anatolia to, to Germany, or the Moroccans or Tunisians or Algerian that came to France, Belgium, Netherlands and West Germany, or uh, all the people of Southeast Asia that came to the UK. Most of these guys didn't come for education. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys didn't come for business. They were not so well off. 
and they had not the opportunity to establish themselves like Muslims here got. So I see that. I see mm -hmm. Muslims here are far more established, far more organized. Yeah. So that plays a big role. It plays a role in the mentality too. You know, yeah, in the mentality, mentality too, yes. Okay. There's one thing that I've noticed too. Um, and, and interesting that you mentioned that because I think this is true for any country. If you find, um, like you compare the average, uh, I'll just give you an example, Indian Muslim in America versus the average Indian in India, right? Or Pakistani or Yemeni or Saudi, right? You look at them, right? Generally speaking, when they're in a foreign country, if they've been raised or, or spend a lot, a lot of time there, they tend to become more religious. And I, and I, th I think the reason also is when you're a minority, and you're constantly questioned about what you have, to, why you believe, what you do this, what you do that. It becomes embedded within your identity because you're seen as that. Yes. And if you're going to be seen as that, you need to understand what that is. Back in the, if you go back to the, I mean, the first time I went back to the Middle East, I was shocked. I'm like, man, I thought everybody's going to be religious and like everyone's going to be like, you know, on the deed mm -hmm. and, you know, it's going to be <laughs> utopia, right? It's even worse than us, yeah. right? <laughs> like, you know, it was just totally backward, right? And, and, and I think it's because Islam is more, since it's, since it is embedded in the culture, you it's, take it for granted. You take it for granted, exactly. Yes. And so they, they if for them, clinging on to Islam, it's clinging on to your identity. But not only that, they're not able to, so the, if you're talking about, I know free speech is a little blurred, but they're not able to speak on certain things on a level that we're able to, and we don't have to worry about so certain ramifications. Yes. I, but that, that is true, but I don't That's think... That's a portion it, of it. Yeah, but That's I don't think... It, but I'm talking about even the very... Forget about, like, issues of resistance. I'm talking about very basic level. Yeah, yeah, no, I Like know. praying, no, like, I know. you know, stuff like this, right? No, no, like, but look, look at, look at the, look at the uh, stigmatization that happened with, like, for instance, Muslims... In the in the in the fifties and sixties in the Middle East, right in the, in the Muslim world, there is this huge onslaught against religiosity, huge onslaught against religiousness. I remember even when I was in Egypt, like the Imam used to tell us, "Hey, don't huddle around the masjid after Isha or after Maghrib. Don't huddle mm. around here because we get in trouble for that." He's talking about the Imam of the mm. masjid because we're used to do that in America. After the masjid, everyone comes outside and talks and chills. Yes. You know, even has tea sometimes, especially in Ramadan. But in Egypt, that was a no-no when I was there, right? And we were like, "Why?" You know, yeah, we, it, 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 yeah, yeah but yeah. They, there's all this pressure for religiosity and youth going to the masjid for Fajr, and you know, it was like even though the masjid's right next door, right? So not only that, but one thing I realize is there's a rebellion that forms, which increases the religious religiosity of Western yes. Muslims. Yeah. There's a rebellion that because they expect, when we go back home, they expect us to completely lose our deen. And we have this deen because of us being a minority. Allah placed us in the situation where we value this deen so much, where we actually rebel against the Muslims back home for lack of religiosity. And we have a certain type of rebellion living in the West of trying to hold on to Islam yes. and trying to make us forget Islam on so many different levels and focusing on our children and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's, it's, it's such a place that Allah put us in. It's, it's an amazing place to be. I could not agree more. So um, coming back to Europe and the scale, I would say UK is most active and France is the least. Yeah. Yeah. I would say... What's I would going on with those French? Yeah. yeah. Look, look, there's look, a lot of scrutiny too, though. Yeah. I, I would say that there are two main factors. You have to look at the government and the majority there. And socioeconomic and, status too. Yeah, the system there. And you have to also look at the people that are there. Where are they coming from? Mm. From which place? Yeah. Are they coming from a brutal history of colonialization? 100%. Like it is right. the, the case with France. Look at what happened in uh, Algeria. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're coming from, from trauma. Not just trauma, but now they're they've been segregated into an area of society where they've just been. Um, it's, it's it's effectively segregation what they've done. Yeah. Like they're in certain segments of Paris yes. where they have large communities and ghettos. They're, they're they're ghettos, and they're given very poor education and and all these laws are imposed on them that they can't wear hijab and uh, and all these other things mm -hmm. related to public. Display it's like of Islam. Yeah. It's just another version of it. Y yeah. You know, there, there was a wonderful movie that came out, and I was, I was, I loved it. It's called Athena. Oh, Athena. Athena, right? Athena, yeah. Athena. 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 Yeah, Athena, right? And it was, you understand because I, from my it's research, Netflix, yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that is a pretty accurate representation of how these Muslim ghettos are. Like that's, I mean, the portrayal of like the community and how people are, the the dichotomy of it, right? And it's it's funny because. They never wanted Muslims to be in the main areas of Paris to make money. 
But when Muslims then created or forced the one enclave and they created societies, then they started condemning them, saying, "Oh, you have Sharia zones, no go zones for the non-Muslims." <laughs> no, that's just that they're condemning them. <laughs> no, look, this is how how nonsensical their criticisms are. They are upset at Muslims for not integrating to society, not adopting their values and customs, and become becoming naked like them. But they also segregate them into communicate communities. <laughs> well, why the hell will they be, become like you? You know, like their hatred is so like the, it's not even organized hatred. Like yeah. if you really genuinely want Muslims to abandon their Islam and leave, you'll like make sure that they're integrated. Just like how you know when the 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 Quraysh were adopted by the Medina mm. in Medina, they were you know partnered up with and they were absorbed into the society, right? Right. So that that's like a, a way you want to integrate people into your your culture, right? Melting pot. But these idiots. Okay, <laughs> if you genuinely want all these Algerians to integrate. But you don't want them um, to live with you. How, well, how are they going to integrate? You know, the hatred is like contradictory. That's, what I'm racism. Saying. That's great. Racism, great observation. racism doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the funny part, I think fundamentally what the West does, a lot of people don't realize is they think that people are coming for freedom fries and the right to, you know, dye your hair pink and, you know, walk around half naked in the street. That's not why majority of people are coming to these countries. They're coming for economic reasons. Yeah. They're economic yeah. migrants. They don't really have an intention to assimilate and adopt. I mean, it's not like someone saying, oh, a, a, a political asylums or as, asylum seekers are different, right? Like they, they want the right to protest or whatever, right? Do yes. things. But most people are economic migrants. They want to be able to eat. And they don't have a problem. Like they don't have a problem being from Morocco or Algeria. They would love to live there if they just had a job. If they had ability to make money, they love it, right? Yeah. They don't want to change their culture. They love yes. everything about it, right? For the most <clears> part. <throat> but coming back to um, Germany and the Turks there, uh, I I spent some time in Europe. I lived in uh, Eastern Europe for a while, six months, or more than almost like eight months, uh, in Hungary, in Budapest. Okay. And, and the, the Hungarians don't like Turks at all. But you find everywhere there's a donor kebab shop, and there's mm. Turks that are proud to be Turks. Yeah, we have halal food, even though the t- Hungarians want nothing to do with it. Like, yes. But they have halal food. They have even pizza stands, halal like they pizza. They represent heart. They, I mean, at least for their own people. I, but do they represent more like? And I'm not. I don't care about this as of right now. But is it more of like a nationalistic representation? It is more. Or is it for me, I saw there. Okay. I mean, for example, when I went to the masjid, I didn't see as many Turks as I thought I would see there. I right. See. I saw more of Africans and and hmm. South Asians that I saw in the masjid. Like, I mean, it, but Hungary is not a good way to look at it because Hungary is a is a very it's not a popular place. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right? It's, it's, it's like an armpit of, of Europe, right? Yeah, Eastern Europe is pretty crappy, yes, honestly. Yes, yes, it's yes, just yes. horrible. Everything below Vienna, like Prague, you know, Hungary, Budapest, uh, Bucharest, Rom- all Romania. these areas. You cannot yeah, compare. No. Th- th- they're just not places that you would want to. They're not like, like Almania. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Actually. Uh, it's not made in Germany. <laughs> yeah, it's not made in Germany. Like, I think the, the, the only other place comparable, I mean, in that region would probably be Vienna, Austria. Uh, other than that, like, mm. you don't want to go anywhere. They, they look at these countries as working force. Yeah. They just come work like three months, six months without That's papers. Great. And so like, like the Latinos here. Yeah. It's the same view they have yeah. on the East East Europe. View them as laborers, right? But um, but uh, but but um, you, know, you know what's funny? I was just, as you were talking about that, I see them seeing the workforce, the Hungarians as or the Romanians and them yes. as a workforce. The Hungarians see the Turks as a workforce. Yes. The Turks see the Syrians who are coming to their country as a workforce. <laughs> just it's, like, it's like everyone is just crapping on on, on a lower class. Yes. Right. Who's going to be the lowest? <laughs> That's Not us. Insane. Yeah. No, no, it is. That's yeah. what nationalism does. Bro. But, but yeah. I mean, just to come back and say, though, I mean, um, I did see, though, I mean, although I'm not going to judge their religiosity, but they were still very much attached to the identity of being Muslim. Yes. Like when you walk into the restaurants, it's very clear like there was this was where Muslims came to, right? Mm-hmm. Even if the, even if the owner himself wasn't as practicing, he made sure that his place was comfortable for practicing people. That's cool. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, no, so you. you appreciate that, especially when yes. I'm like, they living in Hungary. They respect it a lot. Yeah. Turks. Yeah. Like especially when I'm living in Hungary and there's not many halal options, right? You're just happy. I'm eating. <laughs> like I'm going to this one Turkish spot. I'm taking the tram up every like you know every day and meeting the spot. He's not really that practicing, but he's like, hey, do you want a room to pray here? I said, sure. You know, he yeah. put me in the stock room, let me pray. It was, it was Ramadan too, so I was fasting there too. So they were very common accommodating right and yeah. they they gravitate towards it and i think they realize that when you are a minority in places like this no i think it's very relevant yeah. anywhere a muslim goes whether someone's practicing or not it's just it's very different to be around muslims man you know what i'm saying and i think that's where i think that's where Th- that's what i like you were 
you were in that situation. That's what changed your life. You just like being around Muslims, yes. and you put yourself in the Hamza moment. And then what <laughs> happened after that? Okay, okay. But first of all, that's what I like about Chicago Sharif. <laughs> so that's what oh, I no, noticed. Somebody initiated. <laughs> <laughs> comparing, uh, comparing it to LA. So in LA, I think it's the first time in my life that I didn't see so much hijabis as I am used to. Because yeah. in, in Germany, you always see hijabis. I've traveled to a lot of Muslim countries and so on. Also non-Muslim countries, but most of the non-Muslim countries, it's full with Muslims. And uh, in LA, I think on the street, I may have... Uh, so campus is different, okay? Yeah. But on, on, on the street, maybe like 10 times in two months. In Germany, you get 10 times in two hours. Mm. So, okay. so don't forget, though, L.A. is... Yeah. I know, L.A. is L.A. <laughs> it's LA no, but not only that, it, it's like where people go to Flash and the whole thing, right? Yeah. And also, and I have to point this out, it's Tehranjalus, where the, yeah, the Shah... Tehranjalus. Yeah, where, where, the, where the people who are anti-Islam, like pro-Shah, they, you know what? they I, love I, it. I lived in West, Westwood. Okay. In the heart of it, without knowing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> without knowing it, yeah. that's where all Iranians live. If you don't know, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, um, all of them. Yeah, and so there's a huge uh, Jew Jewish yes, Iranian yes. population in Bel Air and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But um, before we move on to the like, Chicago Street and all that stuff, so uh, I, I'm sure you have to be proud of Persian food. Like I, I love it. I, okay. I, I, I look, look. So my wife is Balosh. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. Um, ah, okay. So it's a very similar food. So there's like kubi day, like mustikher, all these things that okay. you guys eat. Oh man, juju kebab, man, I love this stuff. Balochi chicken. <laughs> my, my my heart opens. Is there balochi oh. chicken? <laughs> no? No, 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 no. There's no yeah. such thing as balochi chicken. chicken. But, 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 but you, you, you have to kebab. try the chenge. Did you try chenge? <laughs> yeah, chenge kebab. I, I mean, I have chenge bark. Barch kebab. I had. Okay. I, I had a okay. lot of. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're good. You're yeah, good. yeah. 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 I just saw different dialects. Barch and barch. Yeah. There's yeah, three yeah, different yeah. dialects. But there's also uh, there's like the plum sauce they have, right? I think mm, they make yes. it's Do really you know good. Do What? Palm. Pa uh, oh, oh, badamjan. No, 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 not oh. badamjan. Oh, pomegranate. Yeah. Oh, pomegranate yeah, yeah. Uh, essence. Yeah, yeah. So it, they make a sauce out of it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah. With nuts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. chicken. Wow, mm. that's my favorite. So but, yeah, I, yeah, I have no nationalistic sense at all. I would say, but food-wise, <laughs> uh, look, look. Uh, as a cuisine, as a total, I love the Shami food uh, most. As a total. If you take breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything, but kebab wise, yes, Persians, Persian rice wise, Persians, Persians. Yeah. Yeah. and also some other stuff. I don't know if you know know those stuff, uh, but uh, mainly kebab. So kebab, there's no com. Uh, so I, I tried all the kebabs. Uh, yeah, you cannot compare. And also the rice. I, I always say, a any rice piece on a Persian plate. Is like it has its own personality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> has its own, own, own ID number, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. The safra, wow. zafran, the rice yeah. there. Yeah. But, 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 but yeah. looking at the Turkish yeah, rice plate, hungry. it's like one one unit, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, bro. I, I I went to Turkey. I went there for like a month, and I'm telling you something right now. People are gonna get mad, but I don't like Turkish food, and I tell you why. Like the kebabs, I mean, when you eat like. Indian Pakistani kebab and like Turk, like you know, Persian food, it's just different, bro. Like, okay, they gave me this Adana kebab, this kind of kebab. It all tastes the same to me, just different nuts. It had like <laughs> you know, just a little more, it, and, and it's very gamey. It has that lamb fat flavor, and I'm not impressed by it. What are the Turkish, have you eaten the Turkish restaurants here? Yeah, but listen, I'm telling you, Nunu kebab, I've been to bits of different ones. No, listen. Nunu kebab is Iranian. No, 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 I'm saying, but they used to be Turkish before, then they became Iranian. Yeah. But listen, um, yeah, get your food yeah. straight, bro. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, anyways. Um, but, anyways, just it's, it's just, I, I mean, I went to the heart of Turkey. I, I mean, I ate, there, there's different dishes. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not, um, the kebab I didn't like. The dishes are different. Like, they have, like, I went to this restaurant called uh, uh, Seven Gardens. It's an old, like, a 600 year old restaurant. They have, like, you know, meat like i'm talking about like um like roast beef and like that things like that like they have those kind of things but for me the most the most the best thing i loved about turkey was the apple tea like that was just <laughs> the best thing i loved i know and, 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 and i'm comparing it to like okay bone apple if you, tea? It, you know it's apple tea mm. Okay. Yeah. So, so no. The thing is, but like, if you like, I mean, look. Honestly, you have to compare. If you're comparing like South Asian, like biryani, nahari, these kind yes, of things, and you compare that to his food, or you go to like, uh, like you know, in in the Yemeni cuisine, you have zurbian, you have mandi, you have hanid, you have all these Bro, things. Can, can we take a food? break and <laughs> yeah, all the stuff? Yeah. I'm so hungry. <laughs> what so we're gonna actually do that for this, but yeah. But no, the point being is that so. Um, but yeah, so I was just I just wanted to get a confirmation whether you enjoy it because there are a lot of great places in LA for Persian food, a lot. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Persian food, mashallah. And also, I love Somali. Somali oh, food is yeah. good. Yeah, Somali, yes. 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 Somali, Somali food is good. good. Yes, sir. Got the bananas. Yes. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Alhamdulillah. But, um, so, so you, um, so again, you're pleasantly surprised in Chicago. So, um, but I, I, I think what we want to talk about. I want to get your your take on this. So. You are still on my life story, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, see, that's why I've lived seven lives. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I want to come back to that because I want to go. Okay, now you're in Chicago, but I'm saying that I still find it fascinating that you end up. So you 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 took on this mantle of Islam because you wanted to kind of prove to people that you were Muslim, and then you ended up falling in love and never looking back, yes. right? Um, but what specifically now? I mean, I don't want to go into all the details, but what specifically about? Like the Shaf Aifik and even just the Mamalik, uh, you know, the, the history. Like, let's start with that. Why, why yeah. yes. the Mamalik history and then we'll say why the Shaf Aifik, right? So. Yeah, it's due that we talk about that. So, what happened then is I become religious, and what I noticed is that Islam has a very intellectual depth in it and a tradition of knowledge. And I also loved learning languages. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I learned English like before even we had it in school, okay, as a subject. I learned English because I'm somehow a div- digital native, but I also remember the times we, did, we didn't have internet. Mm-hmm. So it was the time when high speed internet came. I was like 10, 11. Mm. We, did, we didn't have a personal computer at home. My friend had, I went to his place. They were so old. Pages, you may know them, like, do you know Bear Share? I remember that. Yeah, Bear oh, Share. Oh, Bear Share, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's really the uh, really file sharing app. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. there was one before. Kaza, uh, there was a... Kaza, LimeWire. Yes, Lime yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Napster. I remember, mm. actually, we, 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 we started downloading stuff, okay? <laughs> one of the first things we downloaded <laughs> was... California Love by, by Tupac, oh, and, Tupac <laughs> and Dr. Oh, yeah. Dre. So, a, a, and, and the guys, they would just go with the beats. Yeah. But I was like, that's stupid. Maybe they're cr- <laughs> cursing us. <laughs> you don't know what they're saying. We got to know <laughs> We gotta know what they're saying first yeah. before we celebrate. Smart them. man. Yeah. So, so, so that's how I got into English. And with Islam, it was the same. So we would go to Tarawih and stuff, and, and the guys would, would, would weep and cry and stuff. And I would say, bro, you don't you don't understand what, what, what what's mm-hmm. what's what's been read. Yeah. But yeah, I know, but it's about Allah and Jannah. Okay, Allah and Jannah, I got that, but I, I want to know the details. Mm. So that's how I learned uh, Arabic also before my studies. Mm. Uh, alhamdulillah. And then yeah, uh, I, I started studying like uh, city engineering, you know, city planning, mm-hmm. civil, civil engineering, civil. Civil, 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 civil engineering. No, no, it's not civil engineering. Oh, it's, it's about city planning. Oh, so civic engineering? Because it's, it's not engineering. Oh, no, no, uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's called civic planning. I think civic so. planning. Okay, okay, okay. could be. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, we call it Stadtplan, Stadt the city, yeah. uh, city planning. If you mm, translate okay. it like that, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, for a matter of fact, uh, one of the cities we we spoke about was Chicago. Oh, because wow. Chicago is one of the first metropolis uh, big cities they planned with the grid system you mean for the yes. roads right yes. after, mm. the, after the Chicago fire they had to plan yes. the city yes and yesterday i was in 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 downtown yeah and i recognized the things we, we spoke <laughs> about so alhamdulillah awesome. so but i did one yeah it was nothing for me uh, so um, that's when i uh, went to iran and i didn't know that there, there are Sunnis in Iran, myself. I knew there are some Sunnis, but I didn't know how much. Uh, so the, the Iranian population is roughly a bit over 80 million. Mm. And at least, these are the official uh, data. I assume it's more, but at least it's 20% Sunni. And 20% Sunni out of 80 million, how much does that do? It's like... 16, 17 million. 16 million, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I would say. So uh, most of those, you said most are Hanafi, uh, uh, but I, I do not agree because in uh, Iraq, most are Hanafi, but you have also a, a considerable uh, population of uh, Shafis still in Iraq. That applies to Iraq, yes, but most Sunnis in Iran are Shafis because oh, most Sunnis that. are Kurds. <coughs> Kurds are the highest or, or the biggest ethnic group that are Sunnis in Iran. So out of these 16 millions, roughly half of them are Turks, uh, Kurds. Kurds right. 
sorry, Kurds. Then you have Baluch. I Baluch see. are also uh, a lot. You have Turkmen. They are also a lot. Uh, then you have the Arabs in the in the Khalij. Ahwas, yeah. Yeah, no, not Ahwas, Bandar Abbas. Oh. Because Ahwas, they are different Arabs. They are the Arabs neighboring Ahwaz Iraq. Arab. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ahwas al-Arab, they are neighboring Iraq. And I have to say, most of them are Shiite. Yeah. Some of them converted and stuff, but they are also over- And they're Iraqi origin, right? the numbers. There are not so many because uh, I, I, I know the place. Yeah. Uh, it's like 5% or so. But they're Iraqi in origin though, right? A lot of them? Uh, it's the same. They're Arabs, you know? Okay. They're, they're, they're the same tribes and so on. They, mm. are, they will also uh, tell you I'm from this type. Mm. Uh, and it's the same. It's uh, actually, my mother comes from that area, but she, she didn't speak Arabic, mm -hmm. but uh, it's called Abadan. It's it's next to uh, Ahwas and it's the other side to Basra. Mm. Yeah, it's just 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 the uh, uh, the the borders. Yeah, cause I have a good friend of mine, Anwar Al-Ahwazi. Uh, okay. He does, you know, a lot of work and he's from Ahwaz. I think he's from that area, too. So he talks a lot about how their family actually they were originally Shi'i, but they became Sunni, yeah, but they faced there. a lot of persecution like now they're in Australia now but they have a huge confederation of Sunni Ahwazi that like yeah yeah if, yeah. if you want to call it converts I don't want to say yeah, that yeah. the Shias are not Muslim but they just they changed the confession right so uh, but uh, in Bandar Abbas you have genuine uh, Sunni population and Bandar Abbas you, you have black Iranians yeah so yeah yeah because Bandar Abbas is a crazy place you know all these Khalij uh, areas those on the coast yeah you have a mixture of uh, ethnicities. Wow. It's so it's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you you have it in Oman. You have it in Bahrain. You have it, and you have it in Bandar Abbas, and yeah, and and, and there are places you can, like, thirty minutes ride uh, on a boat. You get to uh, Abu Musa, and then you have Ras Al Khaima. So I, I went to the Kish Islands. Ah, you, you went to Kish. Yeah, I used yeah. to live in Dubai. Kish is nice. So I went to the Kish Island, yeah. and it Did was you really, like it? oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's nice. beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. I love Kish. Um, they have a dedicated airline just to go from Dubai to Kish. It's like Kish Airways. <laughs> just goes back and yes. forth. Yeah, it's just that close. I mean, it's literally like a thirty-five minute, forty-minute flight. And Dubai is packed with Iranians. Oh, you know that. Arustamani, all these family names. I mean, the, one of the Best oldest Kish. restaurants in Dubai is a, 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 a Persian like kebab place. Whoa. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing restaurant. It's called the old restaurant, but it's it's, it's like, but there's a, a another in Oman. They even have Naruz tell like when you go in there, like even the phone service is like for Iranian. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. So long story short, I went back, I studied Shafi fiqh at the university in the in the Kurdish region. Oh. So I was in a Sunni region. Wow. Yeah. So my my family in in Isfahan when they heard I'm <laughs> I'm moving there. They they went nuts <laughs> because because people there because at the beginning of the revolution the courts didn't accept the yeah the the, the state Khomeini, and, yeah. yeah they they fight like two years they fight and uh, they have guns and stuff and you know this pishmarga and all these groups but uh, I went there and and probably I'm the the only person that studied this subject or any Sunni subject because there's also Hanafi fiqh yeah there's Shafi fiqh and Hanafi fiqh uh, in uh, Iran from abroad probably but especially from Europe wow and I, I, I wouldn't tell people that I'm from Europe <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell and uh, I'm, I'm I'm good at this so <laughs> the people didn't so you can speak Kurdish pretty recently you pretty uh, look, look, look. Persian is my mother language my Persian is good very good because I also went to school and stuff I did the pre requisite exam to go to the university which is called concours it's a french system okay which is four hours they go 12 years to school just to do that exam yeah oh, wow. 12 years school and you do it's all dependent on on the exam it's a silly system doesn't make sense so if, if you mess up the exam you you can you can't participate next year you have to wait one year is that a language it's exam what, what? Or, or it's it doesn't make sense at all it's all the subjects you have to you have to pass in all the subjects <laughs> in to, four hours in four hours really all the subjects it's like 12 subjects wow. yeah so what i did is i left those which are because you, there's also a, a software you can see how much do you need from what yeah mm -hmm. yeah i did that and i just learned so much so that i passed and i passed you got mm -hmm. it yeah masters makes mass sen a sense you just do the subjects that are uh, related to your and, and I, when did you have to take this four hour exam 
you do it some months before signing into university. To university. And then yeah. you go to the university. I, I went to the university. I studied four years. Bachelor's, regular time, four years. It's not three years there. It's four years. Yeah, I was in Kurdistan, Iran. Uh, and wait, this was in, in uh, city planning or in Shafi? Shafi Fiqh. We're okay. talking okay. about Shafi Fiqh. City okay. planning was just one year okay. in, uh, in Germany. Okay, so so you stayed with the Shafi? Yeah, we had Sunni professors. We had actually one... Arab, Iranian Arab professor who was a hardcore Salafi. I never saw such a wow. firm Salafi in my life. Wow. <laughs> so you wouldn't ex expect that, but yeah. Allah Allah has it's his ways. Allah. Yes. Yeah. Um, because there is, yeah, I mean, there are some, but usually they tend to be Belushi, like Abu Muntas or Belushi. <laughs> like they tend to be a little bit, you know, more on the <laughs> polemical side. Yes, yes. So, but this is interesting that He's in polemical. academia, wow. because I'm assuming he was probably confined to He the was campus. very knowledgeable. Yeah, by yeah, the way. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 But well, um, just, just, just his uh, mindset. But yeah. one thing I noticed about the Kurds too is that Kurds have a, because they're such a small population and they, again, they've always been in this fight for having their own country and state. They have their own identity. But when they do something, yeah. that's one thing I noticed even in like Islamic studies, they go all the way. They're very organized. Yeah, very organized. Yeah. I knew yeah. someone in Egypt. There's an Iraqi joke organized. about this. Hmm. Uh, Iraqi guy told me that. They're making fun about the Kurds, okay? But it tells you the mentality. So there was one Arab guy and one uh, uh, Kurd guy walking the street, and they found, uh, w w walking the road, not the street, and they found a uh, meqas. A uh, scissor. Oh, scissors, scissor. yeah. They, they found a, a scissor on, on, on the road. So they, they, it, w it was broken, okay? So the Arab guy says, this is a knife. <laughs> And the the the, Ira uh, the court guy says it's a scissor, mm -hmm. so they g get into a fight. They fight each other, and you know the the Arabs invented the joke. So what happens? The Arab one takes the court and throws him into the river. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the 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 court guy he's uh, drawing, he's drowning, dr drowning. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's drowning, and when he's drowning, and the last seconds, his head is uh, beneath the yeah. water. He does this movement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this just tells you they that stick. He's, they he's stick, headstrong. Yeah. Headstrong. They stick yeah. to there. Yeah. And yeah. that's how they are. And that, that's a good quality. It's it's a sometimes good it's not a good quality yeah. also. But uh, you can use it the right way. Yes. Yeah. So, so so coming back to this. Uh, so why did you choose again? I mean, if there's Hanafi available, many okay. of the Hanaf, why did you choose the Shafi'i Are you all Hanafi, by the way? I have to. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm Shafi'i. You're Shafi'i. Good, yeah. good. It's half half. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so no, it was not a very deep consideration. So I changed my madhab like one year after becoming practicing, mm -hmm. and I, I, I didn't go with the theology of the Shiite, but I practiced like like a Jafari would do. Mm -hmm. But I noticed there are so much differences, and the theology is influencing the fiqh and so yeah. on and the sources and stuff but the brothers with me they they were diplomatic about it yeah they said you can do it it's all fine and stuff but so I, wait, I, I didn't want a diplomatic answer i just wanted to wanted figure real things answer. out the yeah. real answer and i also saw uh, them not so qualified they didn't learn arabic and stuff and i learned it myself and then i compared just the biographies it was not a deep uh, uh, consideration, but later on, learning uh, the 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 usul and stuff. So we learned a lot of usul. So my 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 uh, my undergraduate uh, was the field was shafi fiqh. It's called shafi fiqh, but we mostly learned usul, not furu. Oh. And uh, learning usul, I'm 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 uh, uh, radi satisfied. I'm satisfied yeah. by the uh, decision. So yeah. I don't regret it. No, I think uh, that's very, very important. I'll tell you why. Is look, generally people when they see differences of opinion in fiqh, they confuse that with the furu, meaning they confuse that with saying, "Oh, the fiqh, this has to be sahih." That it's not sahih. But what ends up happening is when you're seeing a difference of opinion actually amongst the imams, meaning the the ima the four imams of, of fiqh and jurisprudence and a few others they're actually differing in usul they're not differing in the fiqh itself yes. so and actually to understand the difference of opinion you don't actually go to the hadith to see why yes. are they using a quote unquote da'if you actually have to know, understand the usul and I think when you mention that's very important there obviously has to be a balance right because sometimes you'll see people they're very very strong in usul but they're very weak in the furu'ah mm -hmm. um, and they become very philosophical which mm -hmm. is fine 
And then you see some people who are very weak in the usul, but they're very strong in the furu, and they also become a different level of mutashaddid, yes. different level mm. of staunchness. There has to be obviously a balance. They have to both flow. And that's what makes a faqih, a faqih. Yes. They've understood the usul and they've. And you're actually very fortunate because the people who study Shafi'i fiqh and Shafi'i usul, you're actually with the jumhur, right? You're, you're with the general populace, right? The three madhabs, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, and the Shafi'is generally have the same usul. Yes. The Hanafis <laughs> chose to be very different, <laughs> but there's a reason for that. It's because they were from Iran and they were the people of Ra'i and they have a different way of conducting themselves, right? Yes. So for you, this actually probably made it really easy, especially even in your travels, to acclimate to even your studies. Right? Yes. And, and if you can just kind of delve into that, like you're, you're done with your studies now, you've studied Shafi'i Fiqh and you focus heavily on usul. Where do you go after that now? Yeah, I went back to Germany. Okay, so what um, got me there uh, was I married, and uh, but I continued my studies there. I did uh, my masters in Islamic theology. Beautiful. Yeah, so Islamic theology is like Islamic studies that you have here. What happened after Edward Said wrote his book Orientalism mm -hmm. is that. The subject Orientalism was like labeled as somehow racist or you get the idea. So what a lot of uh, university departments would do is reframe it, okay, uh, or rename it and so on. But some changed, some didn't change. But what happened in Germany is, you know, especially after 9-11 and the caricature, the, the Denmark caricatures. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Islam was a big thing yeah. in media, in education, universities, and yeah. everything. And it's all it's it's the 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 reaction that that you also spoke about. So people, when they get under pressure and intimidated and so on, they get more religious, and that's what happened in in Europe. The 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 immigrants from eighties, nineties, two thousands, they were not that religious. Their parents were, but they were not. My generation and, and those after, we dis rediscovered Islam because all of what was going on in uh, media and stuff. So what happened is the governments also wanted to take a lead in, in producing and framing uh, the Islamic discourse. And you see this especially in France. In French, it is very ridiculous. <laughs> okay, in Germany, <laughs> in Germany, it's also ridiculous. But they they, they try, <laughs> but they try. Okay, they had like they had a, a, a secular liberal uh, uh, mosque in Berlin, uh -huh. and nobody showed up. I saw that they yeah. you know, they built a, a brand new structure for them. It was like a state, yeah. state of the art. Like it was supposed to be like an art, uh, like like an art piece almost, right? <laughs> Look, th 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 there's plenty of them, but the, the the one in Berlin was really ridiculous because <laughs> first first of all the name, it's called Ibn Rushd Goethe Moschee. <laughs> okay, Ibn Rushd Goethe Moschee. You know Goethe, the like his Shakespeare of of Germany is Goethe. Mm. He's a very known yeah. poet. He wrote the book the uh, the Faust Faust, <laughs> not the Faust the Faust uh, Fist, which means fist is very known. What has he do? To do life anymore, right? No, mm. no, no. I think we're we're back. We're okay, we're back. All right, great. Let's see. Yeah, let's just check it really quick. Will you two? Go on. Let me Oops. um try to see what's going on here before we start up again. Uh, I don't see it. Hold on, let me refresh the page. Okay, I see you live, Sim. Great. You're good. All right. You're confused, but you're good. All right. So, so the thing that, um, as far as a Berlin mosque, like I said, that's that's kind of a statement that people try to make based on having a certain type of imam. My my kind of con uh, uh, curiosity is, what is it like specializing in Islamic studies in a master's program in Germany, which is known to kind of be like the heart of what started Orientalism, right? So, what is it? What is that like? Like. Who who who's teaching you, mm -hmm. and what level of defense do you always have to have when you're learning? It's not like what's the culture 
for you? Because that's going to obviously form who you are. That, that's a great question. So why I spoke about, or uh, the reason why I spoke about um, European governments also wanting to frame the discourse um, because they saw the rel religiosity that was popping up in, in our generation is because it also influenced how universities would teach. Mm -hmm. So this field, Islamic theology, is very young. So I think the first program was 2010, 11, and then they expanded it. And now it's all over the place. You have it in, in most uh, huge universities. You have it in uh, Hamburg, you have it in Berlin, you have it in Frankfurt. So, and every, every department is different. They, they have their own agency also. It, it's, the, the idea is Islam told by Muslims. Okay. Because you, you had one professor who was teaching a, a subject, it was like those teachers who would later teach seven, eight graders Islamic religion, because you can, you can choose between Catholicism, uh, Protestant, Islam, and atheism. Mm -hmm. Atheism is like phil ph uh, moral philosophy or, or stuff. Niche. Yeah, I got that stuff right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Islam was then the teachers, they were taught in a university program. The one heading the university program, he was a confessing Muslim. But after some years teaching those guys, he said, I believe in Islam, but I don't believe that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was a historical figure. Wow. Okay. So what happened is the great Muslim organization, Turkish organization, DTIP, they were they had a contract with the university I see. that they will cooperate. They, they, they said, we, we won't cooperate anymore because he's saying he's Muslim, yeah. but he doesn't believe that yeah. the Prophet no, that actually normal, existed. Yeah, he's not a normal Muslim. Yeah, so what yeah. the university did at first was, no, we're going to stick to him and that's it. But later on, the, the state also recognized, okay, we have to find somehow a solution. Now they have a new guy. He's also <laughs> very <laughs> special. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, let's leave it at that. <laughs> let's leave it at that. He now says Jannah and Jahannam is not a real thing, you know? Mm. He went <laughs> a bit from prophet to right. Jannah. Yeah, wait, wait so. not a real thing or it's not eternal? <laughs> no, what he says is like it's, it's a symbolic. It's right? symbolic, a metaphor to scare oh. uh, kids and oh. stuff. So the next will be there's no real shaitan. To scare just, kids. Uh, I think that was like originally. <laughs> to scare what? kids. Yeah, it, it, it is how, how it sounds, you know? <laughs> no, no, I think that was like originally like a what is it like type belief right no right. no, no it's not Mutazilas. i have to defend them here it's some f uh, philosopher i i, I yeah, read so it some philosopher islamic philosopher said that like even sina and so yeah because the Mu'tazila did not did, it wasn't an issue about whether it's real or not they just be differed over whether it's eternal or not yeah. like the punishment yeah. like not of eternal but they believe it was a real place you go to yeah the eternal uh, yeah. notion is in kalam some yeah. Uh, very famous figures in Kalam had had this notion, yeah. but uh, saying it's a, met a metaphor. No, no, no. Kalam group said that. Anyway, yeah. um, the 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 place I studied at, they were the most traditional. I have to say, but I didn't like like this wizard mentality. <laughs> you know the what mentality? Wizard, wizard, wizard mentality. <laughs> so when you go to the state, yeah, you're different, and then you teach something different, and you know. Uh, I didn't like the, the the concept of it as a whole. Okay, you you either teach us Islam from a Western perspective, which is totally fine, or you teach us theology as it is. I studied theology in bachelor's. Mm -hmm. I know how it is. I'm 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 a confessing Muslim. I know how it is. But this <laughs> playing two two games, you know, yeah. this wizard mentality, I, I don't like it. So that's why I changed in my masters to Islamic studies. Mm. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and sometimes I I, I make fu fun of it. I don't mean mean this literally. Yeah. But you know, in al munafiqin fi dark al asfal min al nar, which means al kafirin they one one step <laughs> above, right? Uh, thank you. All right.
That's dark chocolate, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. healthy. It's good. We want to be healthy. It's, yeah. Usually Halal and طيب. Yeah. <laughs> Usually our guests bring us horrible, like, you know, fattening food. So <laughs> we're grateful you, you thought of our health. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Anyways, Bismillah. So, 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 so that's why I went to, to Islamic studies in the, in the PhD program. And I have to say, uh, the PhD program, uh, Islamic studies, I learned a lot. Mm. So they, they give you a perspective that you don't get in the traditional uh, way and also in the in the Islamic theology which is also taught on on universities let it be Azhar or Medina or so the the historic perspective is missing that's what I gained I see but also what you notice is it's very f- f- theoretical and I have one anecdote with which I, I I want to emphasize on this point you have orientalists who studied Islam or studied fiqh their whole life but they don't know nothing about the practice yeah for instance that happened with me so one of the biggest orientalists that lived in my lifetime passed away when I was in my last year of my masters okay and he lived not far from where I studied Harald Motzke okay and he was an expert on hadith. He really was, and his 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 uh, his point of view was very moderate. It was not like this old guys, Goldseer and Schacht and John Boyle. So his his uh, view was that, uh, briefly speaking, the tradition is right about uh, the 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 size of hadith, the, the size and the like the chain of narration. When they say Sahih or Hassan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ca- categorization. The categorization. Yeah. The categorization. <coughs> it's it's roughly if meaning it's meaning the the science they put behind authenticity of it. Meaning yeah, how, and, how and probable it is right. that it is authentic. Yeah. He said he, he studied it and he said it's it's roughly right. And he was one of the first non-Muslim Orientalists to do that. Now it's 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 common. I know you had Jonathan Brown here. I think more than one time he also played a big role in this. But uh, at the time he wrote, uh, it was uh, not common. And he was one of the first to pause it, uh, this, this. So I was very um, happy when they called me to, because he died. And when he died, his, his uh, wife called our university and said, I have so many books. I need someone to take all these books and archive and so on. So we went for archiving. Mm. So I remember it very, very good. So it was like the first day of Ramadan, wow. I think 2019. We went there. And then in the, in the middle of the day, his, his wife came in and she brought a miswak. Oh, wow. And she said, we also have this one. Who wants that? <laughs> I took it immediately. Yeah. Okay, just. It's not Baraka, but you know. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. <laughs> to, to have something from s- such a figure, he, he gave all his life for, for the study. I have a, a lot of respect uh, for him. And it was interesting. He had this Islamic stuff also, not just books. Yeah. yeah. And we could tell he had maybe a different secret life. I don't know with about that, that but it's he a had the affiliation of. Yeah. of no, no, you, you could see that. He to also from the books. Maybe. No, yeah. I, I, also from the books. I think what's interesting is that these people that study from an, from from a academic and secular perspective. There are certain undeniable truths to them, whether they believe in Islam or they don't. Yeah. There's certain things they recognize clear benefit in, and they're they like, okay, this is good, and this is inherently it's good. Like we know, we've studied it, we know it. I may not believe in it, but whoever made this, whoever came with this system or advice, we know that it's, it's sound yes. advice. And I find that among many of them, they'll say like, for example, there are um, there's a professor uh, who talks about um, I forgot his name, but. Um, I think he's from Wichita, maybe, or whatever. Anyways, the one who did the series on Khalid bin Walid, the greatest general, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, the one. Yeah. And, like, you can tell the conviction that he has about, like, not just about Khalid bin Walid, but, like, the, the, the system of governance for Banu Umayyah and all these things he talks about, right? You can oh, tell. Oh, you're talking about the uh, Austin uh, professor. Yeah, maybe that's what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah um, what's his name? He's got a Greek name. Okay. We all know who he is, yeah, but, yeah. but I'm saying someone like that is absolutely convinced that the Muslim armies engaged and they were superior militarily and they had and there's certain reasons like meaning that it wasn't just strategy like there was something 
divine about it, right? There was something that was a force behind it. They can't, they may not call it God, they may not call it whatever, but you can tell that they have this deep admiration. They have a huge respect. And, and uh, Roy yeah. Casagrande. Thank you. Ah, okay. So then she said, we, we couldn't figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. And even two or three of his colleagues came here and I showed it to, to them and they, they didn't know either. So I took it and I also, what I took from, from, from this um, situation is that, look, he studied all his life and even his nearest colleagues and his wife don't know what a miswak is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he probably knew because he 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 bought it, but they they're also uh, fellow fellow academics, his colleagues, you know, who teach Islam, but they don't know what the miswak is. Yeah, no, and I'll tell you why, and I want you to continue because I think uh, it's awesome. We're talking about all these things. I really want to get into the Mamluk thing, but I think if we if we just look at this in a, in a very very clearly in a holistic manner, look at the thing that he you actually grasps grasped from him. It was a miswak, right? We have to understand that the amount of hadith that are about a miswak reach the level of mutawatir. It's yes. no doubt mm -hmm. that Rasulullah used a miswak. And in our deen, mutawatir is something that if you deny it, it takes you out of the fold of Islam. Mm -hmm. This person, whether he used it or not, he understood out of all of the things you could collect from Islam, it happens. It is not a coincidence. It's a miswak, which is on the level of mutawatir. I love this because he writes about mutawatir. You know. Yes, sir. No, you could tell by the symbol symbolism. Mashallah. I didn't think about this. No, you could tell. You could tell he's a, he's a very good researcher. If he had, that's what he told me. He had a miswak. My eyes lit up. I was like, this is something amazing. And obviously, you carry that legacy, and you have that certain respect for him, right? I do. But it's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Even at the level of a miswak, makes something recognized. Even in your view, like you're not going to look at him, like whatever. Of course, we read hadith about Rasulullah Islam, but when you see a researcher, and he has something like that, your level of yaqeen in Allah, even through a miswak, is is something profound, right? Yes. So that's why that's the way I'm looking at it. And I think that's a beautiful thing that you just. I'll have it. I'll snatch it, right? And I th I think that's really really important. Um, are you guys cool if we move to the to the Mamluk stuff? Because yeah. I'm like itching yeah. to talk about this. So, what brings you now to specialize in the Mamluk period? Wow, it's, it's been a long way. Yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been itching to know. <laughs> yes, yes. How did I end up there? So, yeah. So, w what I did, my my uh, bachelor's was on Shafi fiqh, right? My master's. I had Islamic theology as a, as a as a field, but we had to write a master thesis at the end of, of the studies. So what I did, I was always interested in the quest of ijtihad and taqlid, because me changing my madhab, and also after changing my madhab, I realized even in the Shafi madhab, you have different like uh, turuq, uh, branches. branches and they would differ so much and you had a whole system of just uh, categorizing and typologizing the jurists and the opinions and which is the right one and stuff and I knew that the, the ijtihad controversy was very huge especially in uh, modern times and for me, it was always a big, big uh, issue. When, when, when do you get a mujtahid? Uh, is a muqallid allowed mm -hmm. to change his madhab? Mm -hmm. Or in some occasions, because there were also stuff in the Shafi madhab which did not make sense for me. Okay? Uh, and I, I, I wrote on ishtihad and taqlid in, in, in my master thesis. And in my master thesis, I realized that most, the people who in investigated this question most were people from Islamic studies. So I found far more sources in English. Wait, who else would question it other than Islamic studies? I'm not, I'm not getting that part. I, I mean, Islamic studies from the Western academia. I see what you're saying. In English. Mm. Not, not, not in, in, in the, in the Islamic world, world mm. in the Muslim world, in Arabic. So, so wait, can you can you give an example of something within within the Shafi'i like that you didn't agree with, like the Shafi'i? Ah, okay, you're still there. Okay, let me guess. It's probably going to be about like touching your wife. 
Look, that's <laughs> we'll do again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one thing. Yeah, that's, that's one. A thing. lot of people from joining the show. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know that, and it's uh, <laughs> right. So it doesn't no, no. It continue doesn't? what you're saying. No, go ahead. Stop what? goofball. <laughs> Stop me, man. Go ahead, go ahead. Bismillah. Actually, that, that is one of the one of the uh, opinions. There are others also, and. Um, I would prefer we, go, we we don't get into this because like the opinion on hyena meat, huh? <laughs> on hyena meat, like there's an opinion. No, he's on the talking about usul level. He's not talking okay, about okay, okay, okay. He's not talking about fiqh level. Okay, on usul level. Yes, yes. Okay. If you if you see how the evidence is is built on on what it is built up, mm-hmm. so yeah. So you're you're saying from basically like maybe just reading through our risale like from that perspective, like you disagree with some certain things from that at like the qawaid. Yeah, look, uh, the the madhab, the madhab found us. They had opinions, uh, uh, w- uh, which their students didn't agree with. All madhab are like this. Mm-hmm. There's sure. not one. Mas- yeah, and the Shafi madhab, you ha- you have this. You of have course. this where yeah. they say, okay, that's his ma- uh, opinion. But the madhab later on changed the, the opinion. Okay. Um, also, Shafi he changed his uh, opinions on on. Uh, Everybody does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 he's uh, famous for that because he had students. Uh, back in Iraq and he had students in, in Egypt and that which counts is, is the Egypt version uh, the Madhab al-Jadid but even in the Madhab al-Jadid you have his uh, Egyptian students who don't agree with everything okay and even al-Muzani he wrote the Mukhtasar al-Muzani okay and the Mukhtasar al-Muzani is even more important than the Risala because the Madhab is based on the Mukhtasar not on the Risala because that was the formulation of everything yes he summed everything yeah. up and in the uh, introduction of the Mukhtasar he said I- I've wrote this Mukhtasar for you <laughs> for you guys but you gotta know I, d- I don't do Taqlid and Shafi forbid a- anybody to do Taqlid from him yeah. and for hundreds of years they were arguing about this sentence because it's a paradox. If you say we are following Shafi, but Shafi <laughs> <laughs> forbade you following him, what do you do? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So after they settled after two, three hundred years, <laughs> they say it's fine. Inshallah, he, w- he won't be uh, uh, so mad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny when you think about that, like how casually say, a couple hundred years later, they settled yeah. it, right? <laughs> Meaning that that's... How much sh- happened to that? No, but not only that, ago. that shows the the de- the rich... Like, America is, hard, is just a little over 200 years old, yeah. right? <laughs> Empires don't even last, like... It's crazy. Do you know what I mean? But but in this grand scheme of things, we talk about a thousand years of history, yeah. this is just a little portion of yeah. it, yeah. right? It's just a little piece of it. That's why I'm, I'm getting... I'm starting to understand before you were mentioning why you chose a suyuti and because... Now, now getting to Suyuti, yeah. when I uh, researched the Ijtihad uh, issue, mm. there was one name popping up. Yes, sir. Suyuti, 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 Rahimullah. So I realized, okay, I, I have to see what he has got to say on this and what his opponents have to say uh, on, on, on his views. So, and I realized most of fiqh that we know nowadays and knowledge production uh, happened in the Mamluk phase, especially Shafi Madhab. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Hanafi is a bit different, but Shafi Madhab is like this. If if you think from from Rafi'i, Nawawi, it's all Shafi Madhab yep. until Ansari. Yeah, the most uh, popular uh, jurist and Suyuti, he was like, he was a free thinker. You know, he didn't restrict himself with the boundaries of tradition and the, the religious caste, so to speak, in his time. He, he, he had his own way. He did it his own way. And he, he went very far with that, I would say, because he also got in a lot of beef. He was under a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I think it's an important note here too. Like, there's people today like who refuse to call me Imam, right? They say Jalaluddin is Suyuti, right? I mean, for the very reasons why of this. But I, I think this is a the great Azhar, example. The Azhar has, has still a problem with him. Yeah, and I think there's a. The, but correct me if I'm wrong, but this is just an example of what happens sometimes when you take the Akal a little too far. And you begin to rely okay, can solely. You get, can you guys explain because this is going over a lot oh. of listeners' heads? So, so basically, uh, all we're saying is that um, 
just some people have different opinions. So they didn't call him an imam. They just called him Jalaluddin Suyuti. But I'm saying the use of intellect sometimes can take someone a little... When, when it becomes a little bit detached from the naql, the, the, the text, it becomes... You kind of come into a, a danger zone maybe where a person who's untrained or not... Who doesn't have people to bounce the ideas off of, you can kind of go off on a trajectory that would say, oh my God, what are you coming up with? So they, they tried to um, uh, take away his influence... On people because he was going into their they, dangerous they territory. To censor him. Yeah, censor him. He oh, he so. he stepped out uh, uh, out of the madhab on some occasions, or even not stepping out of the madhab, but he took one minor uh, minor opinion mm. of the madhab, which in his view had a stronger evidence. Okay, uh, just researching on this topic and the madhab and ishtihad and taqlid, I realized taqlid and the madhab had more a social function than it had a epistemic function. Mm -hmm. mm. So what they will say, if, if you read the tradition, they will say the first imams and the first generation, they were like super minds. Okay, their, their brain, they had super brains and they, they were the most knowledgeable and most intelligent people and so on. Okay, and later people weren't on their quality and it was a graduate uh, gradual, gradual decline gradual decline mm -hmm. of of uh, qualification mm -hmm. but i i doubted this because when you see technology uh, approved and people were reading more books and if you look at the qualifications itself they were more qualified, actually. If you see how many, because because that's more numerous, how, more numerous. No, yeah. yeah, yeah, more knowledgeable. Because that's how knowledge and science works. They evolve. It's like sports. Yeah. They always make these comparisons. Would Tyson beat Ali? Yeah. Okay. Would LeBron James? Would Kobe beat Jordan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Kobe I'm Jordan sure LeBron, or yeah. LeBron James? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Jordan or uh, he beating uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and so on. Yeah. Of course, because that's how sports works. That's how science works. But we always want to stick to legends and just mystify. You know, that's that's how humans work. Okay, yeah. that's I get that. That's all good. But when it goes to a to to to, to a to a <coughs> degree, when you send send the people, and you the madhab becomes the religion. You know, the yeah. tradition. The tradition. Look, we always say you have to separate culture from religion. Yeah. But there's also one other thing between culture and religion, which is tradition. Yeah. Mm. It's not just culture. The tradition is also, we have to say, we, we have a lot of respect and we value and we learn and we humble ourselves before the tradition. But the tradition remains human made. But wait, the tradition is not the religion. And when you see, like, uh, utterances like you cannot step off the form uh, out of the four madhabs yeah okay yeah they, they say we have an ijma that you have to follow one to follow one of the four madhabs yeah where did this come from where did the number come from yeah so 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 it is more social what do, do i mean with social social is like these four madhabs were adopted by dynasties they were applied on courts. Yes. Propagated by them. Propagated. They were taught in institutions. And people who had power didn't want this system to be in any danger. You know? And free minds, like Suyuti was and others, they they got censored by that. And that's also a a, a, a development that we should put light on because the same thing is happening now you know so i think a, a, a critical approach to islamic history especially islamic intellectual history is also healthy yeah. because if we say everything went fine everything was good how did we decline then yeah it's, it's not logical you cannot just say uh, colonialism came and suddenly the ottoman empire fell no, it's decline begins with, with, with the intellect, with the mind. Mm. And if you don't look at it at the right places, like ijtihad, taqlid, madhahib, and you have bright minds and free thinkers, 
who get uh, like shut down, where do you look at it? Yeah. So that's also a takeaway I got from from Islamic studies. So so so, so pe- to people who might push back, they would say the athar that we have, the traditions that we have, are rooted in Quran and Sunnah, right? Yes. They will say that these are, like for example, um, in a different area aside from jurisprudence, right? Let's say we look at things like aqidah, right? Like we can see that okay, Imam Ahmad came back with an based on the traditions that were from the Quran and Sunnah, how he, he was able to push back against the Mu'atazila, the Jahmiyyah, and all these people, right? I mean, he maintained his position. And now, you could say he was a, a, maybe a free thinker in that time, because the, the, the normative didn't want to have that, right? The, the, the main body was... Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. I mean, even... I would say he's a free thinker, of course. Free right. thinker doesn't mean that you don't stick to text. No, free thinker means you go against the status quo. No, I think what he That's means by tradition, I mean. if I if I, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I think what he means by tradition is a general body of how what the direction that people are moving in regarding I, I don't I'm not I don't think he's referring to the tradition oh. as far as the Quran and Sunnah. So yeah. if if I I'm can not. just say a few things and not then the I, I want to move on. Yeah. Of course not the text, right? So generally the conversation that's happening right now as far as madhabs and stepping out of the madhab, just for the listeners, we have to understand, in Islamic on an Islamic history level, the general the lay people are actually don't know what's happening. This is more mm-hmm. of like a scholarly class where a clash is happening, but later in, in teaching for academics and students and those people who are specialists, they're usually who are busy with this. Yes. The lay people are not really concerned. They really don't know what's happening. So it's not like somebody jumps out of the madhab and someone who's listening right now, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what madhab I am. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's not what this is for. This is yeah. on a very academia, highest level of academia level. So this is not actually concern. Uh, yeah. this doesn't and that's exactly where I'm getting to yes right so you don't need all of this this system had a social function which now doesn't serve as function anymore it's exactly. more so divisive than it is yeah actually. yeah, right. yeah you, okay. now, now you don't have to have this big madhab structure because we don't have the courts now okay so why are you so <coughs> uh, furious and so uh, fanatic hole. yeah fanatic on this you 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 missed two hundred yes. Yeah, yeah and, and on the army thing, there's a video. Uh, that one guy in jo- uh, Jordania, he went to the mall and he asked people about their kalam madhab. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and it's so funny. You have to look it up. So he asked this one guy. He was the uh, uh, most hilarious. He uh, he asked him, and he was bald. <laughs> he asked him, "Are you are you Ashari?" He said, how am I Ashari? I have no hair. <laughs> Sha'ar? <laughs> Sha'ar is hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but you but know, I was going to say, this is really interesting because I think for people who don't understand this, um, there were groups among like, the Ta'asib, like, where basically, like, they, if if you weren't from, like, the, the Hanafi wouldn't speak to the, the Shafi'i, or the Shafi'i mm-hmm. wouldn't speak to the Maliki. And at one point, I think even Taymiyyah comes with the opinion about this, about not even being... Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> um, like you don't have to be a muqallid right? Yeah. Meaning that because he saw the he actually went to the point. He said no madhabs as of right now. Yeah, because uh, uh, people may not know this, but at the haram at one time they had different mitrab. Yeah, like for, for mihrab, yeah. yeah, in the for, mamluk time. Yes. Yeah, yeah it, because exactly. of the is that the mamluk time? The mamluk were actually even also in Egypt. Ottoman. If you see, yeah, yes. yeah. If, but Ottoman Muhammad Ali masjid, masjid, right? They had different. Yeah, yeah. No, a lot of those masjids for hundreds of years. Yeah, hundreds of years. And they also in in the in the in the fiqh books on on prayer. Uh, on on the imam section, they say it's preferable that you pray behind the imam from your masjid. From your madhab, yeah. So if only if 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 the other uh, mosque is so far and so, you are excused. Hmm. What's that? But you know yeah. that this is this is so crazy that's to me. That the Umar that's had to tradition. Go that's not religion. Yeah, that, that's that's a phase nothing. That the Umar had to go through. Yeah, yeah. This is so crazy to me because if you look at it, like the development of the madhab. There are more than just four. Yeah. A lathe. I mean, so, so many different yes. that were there. Hassan al Basri. So many that got lost. But we, if you take this approach that you can only stick to the madhab, you can't benefit from the works of a lathe or Hassan al Basri or people yes. like this who came before. Yeah. Right? You couldn't benefit from them because their texts are not relevant. You just, to you. You're restricting the tradition. You don't serve the tradition. Yeah. You censor the tradition. Yeah. And, and, and but that, that, so, so I think, in all fairness, look, the academic class of the Muslim world, the scholars always had access to Imam al-Layfi's <coughs> and all that. Yes. The late, so sometimes we actually have an issue where 
we try to switch back in the mindset of the layperson and the uh, imma. The imma had access to all these resources. That's true. It's yeah. just that lay people never did, and it's not actually not a huge issue because they're not expected to. The other thing that I think that is very important, and we can uh, continue on to your trajectory, inshallah, of this podcast. Um, there is a phase where the Muslim world, we had a since we're talking about history, there's history of sirah, there's history of tafsir, history of the hadith, and you have a history of sharia, which is fiqh, right? The original documenters from the uh, tail end of the sahaba to the beginning of the tabi'een, and tabi'at tabi'een, and the, the three to four generations that were heavily involved in fiqh and then followed the generation of hadith, right? Those were basically the bricklayers, the people who started everything as far as how we're going to start studying fiqh, right? What ended up happening historically, 400, 500, 600 years is, the scholars that started coming afterwards more and more, they were just adding to the opinions of the scholars that came before. Yes. And according to the historians of Sharia, they weren't bringing anything new. Yes. So what ended up happening was they ended up having lots of more resources but the problem is that's why in in the history of sharia they call it the asr of jumud al fikri where the yes. where the where the brains Decline. where the minds have frozen yeah. yeah intellectual freezing of the intellect right is because they were just adding and adding and adding so sometimes people may confuse that with they came out with so much but in actuality they were just adding and adding and adding like double explanations so what does that now where we talk about Imam Suyuti, where what role does he play now? Because he's at the tail end of all of that, and he understands that he's quote unquote a free thinker. He's under scrutiny, right? And he's in the Mamluk period, and he's probably one of the most renowned scholars in the Muslim world, as far as everybody who wrote in every single yes. subject except yes. for except for mathematics, basically, right? Yes. And mantuk, as they yes. say, right? Even though he's he, he a little bit mantuk, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In like logic, but like so, so why, yeah. why, why Imam Suyuti and uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, I wanna wrap up on 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 this uh, so that we can also speak about the Mamluks in more broader terms. Yeah. But for me, this personality uh, personality type of a free thinker is interesting. Suyuti is just a study case. I wouldn't. I prefer not uh, speaking so much on Suyuti answering your question but on another figure who is far more accessible for the viewers also, Please. which is Ibn Khaldun. Oh. Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. I tell you something. This, um, like, historical lens and social lens was for me entirely missing when I did my graduate and also Islamic theology and having read books also from, from Islamic authors of the 20th century. Uh, and and books which are taught in Medina and Azhar. I also had autodidactic uh, studies. Uh, I tell you something. Most of them are missing the social lens and historical sense, and we need that so much. So can you talk about, talk about because people don't know um, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun has it. Yeah, Ibn Muqaddama. Yes. At a core of it, he was probably a pioneer sociologist. Yes, he is. He's the father of sociology. And some people, the they've father. mistaken his quotes and they've <laughs> made him be as this racist guy. Who, yeah. But his work is really amazing. Like he understands he, why. He has some ra racist statements. So so be it. So be it. Yeah, but, I, I, but I think when you <laughs> contextualize it, it's not j I mean, I read it, right? And these things, <laughs> right? some you cannot contextualize. What are you talking about? You will have a hard time contextualizing. Well, I, well, oh, no, what, what I mean contextualize, what I'm saying is that if you talk about how He's also describing the Arabs. He's describing what they lack in leadership. Yeah, why he, he's he racist to his whole uh, yeah. own people. So it's, it's called not, the equal opportunity. Yeah, racism. exactly. So when you yes. contextualize, he's criticizing each and every a group, yes. right? It's not just one group. No, that's why biased. I say contextualize. He is bringing up things that are, and and it's not in the point where they're forever like this. It's yeah. the current situation is this, and that's yes. why it's they that. they cannot be that. It's right? not the genes. Right. You know, that's the difference. And, and let me tell you one thing. He's ra racist, so what? So is Immanuel Kant. So is Karl Marx. You know, yeah. all of yeah. them ha have really racist statements. So is uh, uh, Martin Luther, the, the, yeah. the founder of, of, of uh, <laughs> They're all racist. What, what he wrote about Jews. Well, Darwin was a racist. 
Who? Darwin. Darwin, yeah, Darwin. Darwinian theory. Uh, the Darwin whole thing is, the is based on racism. <laughs> without, <laughs> without Darwin, there's no racism. Yeah. So, so, so after Darwin, we know it's called racism. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because he spoke about the origin of, of, of origin species, of yeah, and yeah, then they, species, they, yeah. they, his students and stuff, social racism, they applied it to to, to humans, and there's nothing. So it's a really, a really easy step to take, you know, and it's, it's his students. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, so but Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun. When I read Ibn Khaldun, so let all these studies I had aside, and the Muqaddim my side. For me, if I have the scale here. <laughs> okay, I have, I have to think about the marketing also. <laughs> <laughs> so if if I would have a scale, that's all my studies I had, all the degrees and stuff, and then I have the muqaddima, the muqaddima weights more. Wow. Um, yes. That's pretty powerful. Go read Why the do muqaddima. You say that? Why do you wow. Say that? The muqaddima, when, when I opened up the muqaddima and uh, read it, I couldn't believe that this guy, rahimahullah, he died uh, 14... Uh, Five, I think. 1405. Yeah, 1405. Yeah. Ibn Khaldun in, in Cairo. Uh, although he came a uh, very long uh, way to there. Uh, he's uh, Andalusian originally. And um, I couldn't believe that this book is so old. Because the things, the ideas in this book and, and, and the theories he posts, they seemed so near to me. And so modern, I would say modern, because uh, the analytic mind he has, you know, and the critical thinking. Time transcendent. Yeah. Yeah, time transcendent. transcending, like time traveling. There are people, they always on podcasts, they post this question. If you had a meal with three persons or five persons, with, yeah. you don't need that. Just buck, uh, just by the muqaddimah. You think <laughs> he's sitting next to you. The things he wow. says. Yeah. The, 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 the. Uh, all, all the culture wars we are in now, tribal thinking, he analyzes all oh, of it. All of it. Yeah. And he, he begins very, uh, uh, he, he begins how he sees uh, history and he speaks about these narrations that you have to uh, question narrations that go against uh, the, 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 the rationality, yeah. the mind. So, so he, for instance, he's an delusion, right? You would think the, the narration when, with Tariq bin Ziyad telling his army to burn the ships would be something he would be very pr proud of, right? What does he say? He brings like three or four reasons, analytic reasons, with f uh, filled with hysterical data, why this could not be the case and what, why it's uh, not reasonable. To believe that meaning it was a fable it was just something that's yeah something said yeah. to bolster the the victory i, I, I think at the end yeah. he says like if he if he had done this he's really dumb yeah 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 that's something in, in those yeah. uh, terms it's it very unwise to yes. do that he was but, very, but, but, but yeah. he, he proved that it's not true it has no 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 but you know basis. To, to come to that i think w there are many examples of what you're saying i think what i think what a reader could take away from from just even browsing to al muqaddama is the brilliance that he had, the, the the way that he's able to think about particular things that are out of the normative thinking. Like it's not that, okay. Bird view. Bird yeah, view. exactly. The, the elevation view, but you would expect him to maybe adopt a certain position or idea because he's a, from a particular background or, mm. but he's self-critical. He Sometimes is, you read, you think he's not Muslim. Really? Yeah. Really. He he is, he is the Qadi uh, al-Qudha of the Malikis, yeah. okay? The high judge. Yeah, the yeah. high judge in the uh, highest phase of the Mamluk period, okay? Fighting with, with, with the, with the uh, Mongols. Okay, even Taymur Leng uh, took him to captivity. Yeah. He was in Taymur Leng. He spoke with Taymur Leng, <laughs> okay? He and wrote, that's a scary guy, by the way. Yeah, really scary. <laughs> he wrote uh, a map for Taymur Leng. Yeah. It's three weeks he was in his captivity. Okay, he speaks about this. He has also an autobiography, which is in, in his book, because the Muqaddimah is just the introduction, and then it's uh, this uh, voluminous history work, and there he, he has his Ta'arif Ibn Khaldun. Mm. So he is really uh, interesting. Also, Ibn Battuta is interesting. Oh, Ibn yeah. Battuta also has this social lens. Okay, you get a f far more realistic, like somewhat, someone doing a travel vlog. Yeah. If you want, uh, you want a travel <laughs> vlog guy of Islamic uh, history, <laughs> go, go go read Ibn Battuta. So, uh, and if you want the, the the more analytic guy, it's Ibn Khaldun. No, in one one thing, on top of everything you said about Ibn Khaldun, his genius, his father of sociology, 
there's actually a list of, I think, four books in the Arabic language should realize if you've mastered the Arabic language. One of them is Adab al-Katib. And the other, the, the fourth one is Ibn Khaldun al-Muqaddama in the Arabic language. It actually itself is a literary masterpiece of the Arabic language, aside yeah. from the sociology. I get why. You know why? Because the last part of it, he speaks about the Adab. Yes. And he especially speaks about the Andalusian Adab. And there are so many words that, because Andalusian uh, uh, Ghazal and stuff is so different to the Sharqi. I was more um, familiar with the, with the Sharqi. Mm-hmm. So this was really difficult to read. Yeah, I can, mm. I can, I can see that. But um, going back to the Mamluks, so the Mamluks, they produced all these masterminds, if you want. And the, I think the Mamluk is a very nice case study to show the br- brilliance of Islam, civilizational wise. Okay, not just Islam. We have the text Quran and Sunnah, but also this civilization. Is it has this this genius? Why? Because what does Mamluk mean? It's the owned. one's owned, like he's possessed. Yeah, somebody yeah. owned a slave. Yeah. So literally, it means owned. But how it was used it's in like, the vernacular yeah. at that time, it was slave. Mamluk, they they uh, either say uh, abid or Mamluk. Mamluk just means the word slave. That's it. Okay, and you have slaves. That became the empires. Yeah, the masters. The masters. Just, just look. Yeah. That's a that's a good uh, thumbnail so, or, or, or YouTube title, <laughs> right? Yeah. Slaves becoming masters. It 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 sounds like a fairy tale. Yeah. yeah. But it isn't. It is what happened, and they, and they became. I would argue maybe the greatest empire. So, so in, let, in whole Islamic let, civilization. Let's pause there for a second about the Mamalik. So, uh, uh, because people are not familiar. So, the, the the first introduction to the Mamalik most people have is Egypt. Yes. Right. Um, and then, but they don't know that the Mamalik were also in India. They were in other yes. places where they were because they are they a mix up. of people, right? Even the Mamalik are divided among, because the Mamalik who were owned, if, correct me if I'm wrong, they were not just from one region. They were a mixture of people yes. that came from the Caucasus, from, from, uh, uh, from even Turkic origins. Central from Asia. Yes. Uh, 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 Cossacks. Like, I, mean, uh, I mean, many different regions, right? Yes. But. Uh, what is the uh, I I want I want I want the leaders to uh, or reader I'm sorry leaders <laughs> the, the listeners yeah. to understand <laughs> like what is the origin of the Mamadik and okay. and then because I think a lot of that you can after that you can get into why they had this plurality in their thinking within the empire yeah that's a great question so first of all I have to disappoint you guys the Mamaliks were there before you. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it! <laughs> I told Sim the first time. Uh, by the way. I'm one of your first subscribers. You oh, know wow. that? <laughs> yes. you, know, you know, one of yes. our first uh, possible names was going to be the, the Sad Seljuks. Or <laughs> the Sad Seljuks. Okay. The Mad Seljuks. Is far better. <laughs> the, um, You're not sad the, the, at all. They're contemplating a You're kind of mad. <laughs> contemplating a <laughs> <abasids? laughs> uh, Contemplating. Okay. Good, good that anyways, you stuck Mamluks, to, the, to, yes. to the Mad Mamluks. Okay. <laughs> so so, so I, I told Sim, from the first uh, episodes, it was like... The same time when I thought about writing my thesis on on this period, mm. and uh, from the first, pe- and I was waiting. When do they get a guy who explains what Mamluk means? Mm-hmm. And it didn't happen. There was just one Indian guy who who had this Indian mm-hmm. Mughal Empire. Yeah. he spoke a bit about the yeah. uh, uh, Mamluks. Yeah, mashallah. Uh, but uh, I thought to myself, one day I, they they gotta have me on. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and that's how, how how I communicate with him. Yeah. So, okay, about the mad part, I don't know, but about the <laughs> Mamluk part, no. I can tell you. So, the first one introducing people from Central Asia into the army and the 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 closest brigades around the caliph was Ma'mun, because Ma'mun's mother was fr- Turkish from origin. Turkic, right? Turkic. Yeah. Yes, Turkic origin from the Turkic. Uh, 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 folks uh, that you had you have a lot of them and uh, then the uh, Fatimids they also brought in a lot of people don't know that the Fatimids they brought most or, or, or they were the first to bring in the Mamluks to Egypt right so so Ma'mun he was in Baghdad okay but uh, the Fatimids brought them to Egypt then the Ayyubids they bought even more in 
<laughs> they they needed even more and it it was especially the seventh sultan now, is this in the ninth century or ten well, what's the chair talking about? Uh, the 10th century, but okay. now we are moving to the 11th and 12th. Okay. So especially uh, in, uh, and even the, the 13th. And, 12th and, and 13th, the, uh, the Ayyubids, especially the 7th Sultan, which was Al-Malik Saleh Najmuddin Ayyub, he brought a lot of them. And he had his special god, who were all Mamluks. Mm-hmm. And till this day, the Jordanian god of the of the king jordanian king there are this uh people are from uh Sharkas. and people and have to understand that this is a, an era where the mongols were going crazy in the world as well so the, uh, you have to kind of understand the the situation of the world there's these mamluks coming in from the caucasus into the into the middle east but there's also this this over this overbearing or overarching threat of the Mongol invasions happening to you any day now. Okay, in the, in the, in the Fatimid uh, times, we were not, uh, we, we aren't there yet, yeah, okay? Not. And even in the Ayyubid times, uh, in the beginning and stuff, it was against the Crusades, okay? Even the Fatimids, they fought the Crusades also, okay? And then the Ayyubids took over and they also fought the Crusades. So they had, it was a lot of war going on at that time. So they needed these, these, these soldiers and the Turkic uh, uh, folks, they took all over the place. So the, the Seljuks are also Turkic people. Yeah. And the Sultan of Rome, all these places. Yeah. So, yeah. so the Turkic were going nuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the Mamluk ones, uh, yeah. So it was this seven Sultan. And then some of them came very, became very influential, especially Qutus and Babas. Yeah. These two. So it was Qutus who took over the Sultanate from the Ayyubid. So he was the first Mamluk Sultan. And uh, he ruled about 11 months. Yeah, so I was gonna, uh, yeah. me and someone talking about this. Was he not, was his not assassination ordered by either his wife or his sister or something like that to give Babers the power? Like there was some, there was some background right here, right? After he beat the Mongols at Angelus. Babers killed him. Yeah, yeah but, ba- w- but him. was it uh, at the behest Thank of, you. of uh, because... His <laughs> wife or sister wanted like power, but she couldn't obviously rule. Yeah, so but, but I don't think so because no? Babas before that was also very powerful, and they make the coalition mm-hmm. against the Mughals. He tried also Babas to make a coalition with the uh, guy uh, ruling uh, Aleppo. He didn't want to, so how that's how the Mongols took Aleppo. Thank you. Mm. Yes. More do you want me for Didn't make the coalition. He yes. just he said we have this big wall, you know the uh, Aleppo Citadel. Yeah, yeah. We have yeah. that, and this will uh, protect protect us. us, right? Yeah. And it didn't. And then Qutuz uh, saw that happening, so they make the coalition and they um, fought the uh, Mongols and in mm. Injalut, which is between Accra and Jerusalem. Yeah. They won in 1260. But guys, it's getting. Very important here, but I gotta go to the restroom. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You go ahead. Go quick, check, check, should, I, should I get him through? No. Yeah. Oh, he knows the where he is. Okay. You know, the kids are there. Okay. Sheikh, why? You know, it's not polite to take a guest to the bathroom. You shouldn't follow people no, to the bathroom, Sheikh. That, that's not good, bro. Lead Only jinn go in the bathroom. You shouldn't lead him to the bathroom. Only Jews had to harass people in the bathroom, so you shouldn't go there. Harass, <laughs> wow. Taking us to a whole different level, a rather escalation. Well, who else so, would go so harass a person in the bathroom? Right? Sim? Anyways, so... So, wait, uh, let's just kind of talk about some of the stuff you were saying. Yeah. So, in, in 1258 is when Baghdad gets sacked, right? The the Mongols, uh, they killed the Abbasid Khalif, Mustasim, mm-hmm. and they... What, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, you're making a face. Go ahead. No, no, I heard a noise over there. I was like, wait, it just went in there. Why is he coming back out? Just don't worry. It's not important. Thank you. Yeah, don't be so easily distracted by me, bro. I'm well, weird. you're making funny faces. Not right? at you. You're <laughs> literally ma- like googly eyes, like as if I'm like talking different language. Like I got my dates messed up now. I'm, you know, I'm very sensitive to this, Sheikh. Aww. I, I you read your feelings. reaction and I respond. I'm like, oh, Sheikh is giving me a cue. Like, hey, expand further. But when he's making googly eyes, like, woo, I'm confused. I'm like, what? What's going on? Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. I lost my train of thought now. 
We'll have to wait for Brother Arash. No, right? the, 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 the ransacking of 1260, 1280, you were saying. Yeah, so uh, the the Mongols, one of the funny things, at least uh, just to fill some time, was that the, the Mongols were uh, had told the, the Khalif that they took the, the gold knobs off of the doors. They say, if you had maybe invested in your uh, armies, you know, w- w- instead of making gold knobs, wow. you may have had a better uh, defense against us. So they, they, they took pride in, in uh, being the, the scourge of God. Like they said, we are the punishment God. of God, of your God on you. Even though they were kind of like, they, bla- they, they worship the great sky. Yeah. They, they, it was kind of vague. They didn't really care about what your beliefs were as long as you weren't fighting against them. They're like, eh, you know, everyone's welcome type of thing. As long as you submit to us, bend the knee. Um, and, and at this point in, in, the, in the Muslim world, in, the, in 1258, when, when Baghdad was saw, sacked, uh, it's very similar to the situation of Muslims today. There were a lot of these. The Khalif, Musasim, he didn't have much power. He just had power over uh, the small Baghdad area. He wasn't a very like influential figure. A lot of these, uh, almost they were all like vassal states. They were kind of competing against each other for more power and stuff. Everyone was had become like very wealthy and rich and fat, and they're just kind of really competing in the dunya, right? Kind of not too different from us right now. And when you see this the scourge coming, you kind of at least in retrospect, as we see, like, the situation back then, like, oh, maybe there was something that Allah wanted to happen that, exactly. you know, th- this cleaning of state. And this is why we named ourselves the the Mad Mamluks as a, as a show, because um, the, the Mamluks came in this period of history where it was chaotic, and there's a, like, a parallel that we can make to this time where uh, the Muslim world was, is very divided. And... The, the Mamluks uh, had to form a defense for uh, against the the uh, invading Mongols, and uh, if if they didn't, they would be entering into North, North Africa, mm. and and the rest of the Muslim world would be compromised. Yeah, it's something that's very so, much worth mentioning before we hand it back yeah. over to uh, our uh, Doctor Tawakkuli, inshallah, is uh, now the Muslim mind can think, especially those who are inclined to practicing their deen. They can think our history is just full of ups and downs. I thought this was supposed to be the dean of truth. The dilemma that ends up happening with the Muslim mind is the Muslim mind thinks that if it's the truth, there shouldn't be downs. There should only be ups. It's a good spirit to have, but it's not reality. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the situation of a people however he likes, but the iman is not supposed to waver. Rather, when we have downs and dips in our history, it's an opportunity to be the people of Jannah, the people who uphold truth and justice. Oh, justice and truth can only be upheld when? Because it's such a big part of our deen. Yeah. Is it only in the face of non-Muslim tyrannical uh, entities? No. It's also if your own brethren are in the uh, are uh, in in that situation in those dips, you actually have to stand in that face. Also, the second yeah. thing is, and the last thing I'll mention is that we don't base our iman and historical issues, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran tells us about this very, very clearly. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. That's a ummah that came before us. Laha ma kasabat, walakum ma kasabtum. Right? Mm-hmm. You're gonna gain. You're gonna be asked about, or you're gonna earn whatever you did, and they're gonna earn what they did, and about them you're not going to be asked. Right? Yeah. Meaning, in, when you're, in you're standing in front of Allah. So the key here is historical issues are obviously amazing to learn from, and is a part of our history, it's a part of our tradition. But it's not it has nothing to do with our standing in front of Allah. Everything that we do has to do. It comes down to our standing in front of Allah. That's what it is. Yeah. Right. So historically, yeah, there's ups and downs. There's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Muslims were very weak. Muslims were very divided in Islamic history. It doesn't take away from Islam. It doesn't take away from Allah. It doesn't take away from His Rasul. I mean, right? the thing is that this happened during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Exactly. Right, so if it can happen to the Nebi, this is actually but one of the immediately after the Prophet, no, like not literally, like during the, his time, during while he was a Nebi, yeah, I'm saying. right, while he's a Nebi, there's other prophets who are saying that, or false prophets who are. No, I'm, I'm saying and even even to a simple degree, there were battles that were lost. I mean, little things like, for example, not getting, not being able to give the answer to the Yahud right away because of not saying Inshallah, so why he doesn't come to eleven days later? Yeah. Little things like this, or Amil Hizn, like things like where he felt pain and suffering, right? Like, and even certain battles, like the Battle of Khandaq, right? Yeah. How did this happen? How did this happen? 
Hunain, how did this happen? Oh, God, yeah. Right? All these things that happen, like, uh, and, um, you know, these things that happen over the period of, uh, of prophethood, and actually this was one of the signs of his Nabuwa, that he would win some and he would lose some. Yeah. Because ultimately that victory lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And that is in line with the Qadr. You can want something, but if it's not part of the Qadr, then it's not going to happen. Yeah. Allah planned, and this is an example of Rum and, 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 and Fars, right? And, and Persia, about what happened here. Like you have no control over this. You may think you want something, but you don't know what it's going to yes, be. Sir. You may want the the Byzantine to win now, but they're not going to win now, mm. right? That's they're going to come back later. Yes, sir. This is the whole idea of rebounding, and actually, this is the whole Sunnah of the NBA that they 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 have trials and tribulations, ups and downs. How does that refine you? How does that make you a better outcome as an Ummah? Do you learn from it? You take an ibra, a lesson from it, or do you just simply? Just dwell in it and cause more fitan. Yes, sir. Right? That's the whole point, right? Because history is full of... We can even look at certain... Sometimes... And I'm not trying to look at it in a negative way, but sometimes we romanticize the Sahaba too. But they were human beings. They also had issues. Right? There were issues between Khalid bin Walid and Umar bin Khattab and so forth and so on. People think that they don't want to le- read about, but there were issues. Right? But did that take away from the spirit of Islam? No. Did that take away from the wahi that we have? Not at all. No. These are just ways that we learn to navigate. And look forward, right? If we try to over romanticize these things, it becomes a problem because people say, "Well, how are we going to live in the Khilafah today? <laughs> how are we going to have this today?" And they're going to discover, right? They're going to discover when they when they open up books of history, they're going to see a totally different picture, and then they're going to lose faith in you telling them, "No, everything was was uh, kumbaya, my lord." Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, so it was not, and you know the amazing thing about Islam is. It kept coming back. It kept. It has the potential of the comeback, yeah. and that's the amazing thing. Always. And you see, even even athletes, you know, one 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 person I admire a lot in in boxing is George Foreman. Mm. He had the craziest <laughs> comeback, you know. I think he he got world champion at it was over forty. Yeah, he was He's close over, to fifty. Yeah, yeah, forty five or something. Yeah. So that's. So you know, uh, once they, they they asked Tyson when, when he had his comeback about the other guy and so on, and he said he he's into boxing like I don't know, ten years or something, and you are into boxing twenty years or so. He said no, I'm into boxing six months, preparing for 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 this fight. I'm out. You know, yeah. you have to come back from 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 scratch, and this is this is the power of Islam. I don't see the power when when it's in its height. I see it when it's in its low and comes Ooh. back, you know, and this is what happens with the Mamluks. So Babers, you have to study this guy. He's not perfect. He killed Qutus, obviously, but if you see his rise and 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 what he did and his policies and strategies, crazy. So he, how did he became Babers? <laughs> so in 1244, he defeated the Crusaders in Gaza. Love it, bro. In Gaza. That was the first one. Yeah. And then he built his uh, empire, so to speak, uh, bef- before there was the Mamluks. There was still the Ayyubids, but he was a very influential officer who has his had his uh, territory and he would have like uh, contracts and allies and stuff. And then Qutus took over. And yeah, as, as I told, they got together, they defeated the Mongols in Ain Jalut. Tw- like 20 years later, right? Tw- later than no, what? In, in, uh, after, after, after the Battle Russia. of Gaza? It's 16 years to be. Yeah. Okay. But, he, but this is also a time where they believe it where he had like this issue with, with uh, Muzaffar Qutus too, where something about one of his friends being uh, removed or deposed from in, 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 in Halab or Aleppo and they believe that that's why he later on assassinated him because he was mad about <laughs> about that the whole thing about not getting um, there, there are a lot of theories why he did that but at the end of the day he wanted to take power yeah. Okay, that's that's the main main. <laughs> to, to, to that's true. Me. You can justify it how they yeah, want yeah, yeah. to, he, but he, he wanted he power. wanted to take power. Okay, so he's not perfect. Uh, nor not, neither are the the Ottoman caliphs who who, sure. who, who killed their brothers. Okay, right. they're not perfect. You have to live with that. Yeah. But them not being perfect doesn't mean they didn't do good, and they didn't have a legacy. He had. So what was his legacy? So first of all, Angel Lut, you have to, you have to imagine the Muslim state was at its lowest 
Why? Because in 1258, the Mongols, they killed the Caliph in Baghdad. They took over Baghdad. Okay? And Baghdad was the center of, of mm -hmm. Islam. Okay? And they, they, they killed the Caliph. They, they killed everyone uh, uh, of his family, his offspring, everyone. They chased everyone, killed hundreds of thousands of people. And so on. Okay, one one escape, right? Huh? One one of, one of the ambassadors escaped. So 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 yeah, some escaped, and one of them popped up three years later in Cairo. Yeah, Al Muntasir. This is twelve sixty one. Okay, and then Babels, he knew the importance of the caliphate institution. So he, being the sultan, he bowed to him as a caliph. But I have to say here, it was just symbolic. But he knew of the importance. But the Khilaf at the time was also symbolic too, meaning that yeah, it, it was, was it was for it, a long time. They didn't symbolic. have control. Yeah. They were just uh, ally ships. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Es especially when the Seljuks popped right. up. The Seljuks were the big thing, not the Caliph in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Although they uh, swore alliance to him, but power wise it was the other way around. They were the kingmakers. They were the kingmakers, yeah. Right. So but uh, in 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 in, uh, in the Mamluk situation, it was even more. So so it was kind of like a house arrest. He the the, the caliph was was in in in, in Mamluk times. There were some oh. some uh, some caliphs who were more influential, but the sultan also wa 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 don't, didn't want them to gain too much power. You know, it was a symbolic kind of thing, but also it was like we are for we are there for all Muslims. You know, and we will fight any enemy of 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 uh, any Muslim. The spirit remains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, power is always there. It's it's natural. It's it's a human thing. You know, and Islam recognized this 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 um, this drive to power. That's okay, but it's, Islam has boundaries and regulations for that. Sometimes these boundaries and regulations get crossed. But, but that's that's uh, that's the, the human experience. being. Okay. Yeah. So what happened is, well, what are the what are the uh, uh, accomplishments and the legacy of Babers? So one of the things is that he established a quarter-like uh, court system. So he had all the four mashabs represented on the court. So you could you could go to court in your mashab. Okay. Beforehand the there was a pilot project of that in the F Fatimid era, mm -hmm. but besides that, nobody. There was the Ayyubids attempted also, but this was like hundreds of years going on. This court system for for four courts, and each of them having a qadi al qada. But the main one was the Sha Shafi'i. So mm -hmm. so so the main issues would go to the, and he could also intervene. Mm -hmm. Okay, he, he was the main guy because they were Shafiite. Got it. Yeah. So uh, this this was a, why is this a big accomplishment? Because this brought a a, a tolerance with it that all Badhabs are equal and it's all fine, you know, and they all represent the Sharia. So this fights this uh, extremism and stuff. This this is a big accomplishment in my view. So most uh, dy uh, dynasties are not like that. That they have just that that is a big fault of the Ottomans. The Ottomans, they fed into this Hanafi, I would say fanatism that you have in certain areas. It's, it, it's yeah. prevalent pre prevalent today. Still, yeah. the effect of that is still today. Yes. <laughs> like I mean, um, but you know, one thing coming back to this, uh, one thing I was I was I thought was so genius by Babers. See, Muzaffar Qutas, if, if I'm correct, when he, in, in order for him to raise this army, he put imposed a tax on the Muslims. Mm. They had to pay a lot of taxes. Right when Babers comes in, he's like, hey, we're done with these taxes, no more taxes. Yes. So that naturally makes him favorite. Like, like, oh, cool. Whenever you put money back in people's pockets, they're going to love you. Still right? Happens. And so he consolidated power by just doing one simple move that, because he actually came back into Cairo while they were still celebrating the defeat of the Mongols. And goes, okay, I'm the, I'm the new caliph now. I'm the new guy in charge and no more taxes. And they're like, oh, great, double celebration. And wow, they took over. Yeah, cool. it was great. I mean, if you think about it, like, could he have benefited from those taxes? Absolutely, he could have. Mm. But I think he knew strategically that, hey, I have to win the hearts and minds. The battle, the, hard, the harder part is keeping the people united. 
and that leads to I think maybe things like having a different madahib, have the representation, have all of that, right? Because mm. he's he's thinking at a line of how do I have longevity? How do you keep this together? Mm. Th- there was a historian that time uh, who's also a big jurist, Shafi jurist, and he's also a free thinker, who's Abu Sham al Maqdisi. Mm. And he's what I refer to as uh, uh, Madhabi Salafi. Okay, so he remained within the Shafi Madhab, but within it, he didn't accept uh, the status quo of his time. So he was wondering about the irony of history that the Mamluks that are themselves Turkic, they defeated the Mughals that are their brothers in in uh, ethnicity mm. yeah you know he he was wondering about that and history works in uh, mysterious ways so there's one uh, thing the other thing is babel's reunited syria and egypt and historically when you have syria and egypt yeah then you have the strongest base mm-hmm. for building your muslim empire okay another thing he did he made an agreement a peace agreement with Burke and Burke was the Muslim Empire of the Mamluk Golden Horde so the it's uh, of the Mongol oh, Mongol Burke Khan yeah yeah Burke Khan yeah the Mongol uh, Golden Horde so after Chinggis Khan the the, the Mongols uh, they split into three portions you you had the main Mongol, which is uh, in the hands of uh, Hulagu. H- Hulagu. Yeah. Then you have the White Horde and the Gold Horde. And the Gold Horde, the, the empire of the Gold Horde, he became Muslim, Burke Khan. Yeah. And at the beginning, he he, he had his own <laughs> version of Islam. Okay, <laughs> he was still <laughs> Mongol, and he was still. But that was prevalent among many of them. Like yeah. they had this own, and this is what Ibn Taymiyyah would talk about: that hey, are they Muslim, not Muslim? And yes. that big fatwa came out that mm. hey, you can't you can't play with this, right? Either you're Muslim or you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so he wanted also in, in the beginning he wanted also to conquer the Muslim world, but he was more like in. Caucasia and and those east eastern Europe, they they, even, those yeah, areas, they yeah. even invaded Poland. Yeah. They went to mm. Poland, yeah, yeah. And there's still there's a still Tatar population in Poland right now Subhanallah, till Allah. till this day. Hungary, Crimea, uh, the Magyars, they in all Hungary, have Tatar. All, yeah, yeah. It's from that time. Yeah. So Burke Khan, but what uh, upset him most was that Hulago killed the Caliph because he was Muslim. He saw it as a personal insult. And he had also issues with Hulago. Yeah. Because it was like, who is going to replace... The favoritism. Yeah. Who's yeah. going to replace uh, Chinggis Khan? Who's going to be the main... Mm. So, so, so they, they were in, in the competition. And he, he, he was Muslim and Hulago was not. So he saw it as a personal insult. Okay, you can take Baghdad. But you don't kill my caliph. It was like that. Okay, so what happened? Babers noticed this 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 friction and this this uh, tension between those because they also captured a lot of Mongols. His wife was Mongol, one of his wives. Who Babers? Babers. Oh, yeah, wow. he had a lot a lot of spies, a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, so I love it. It's so like Game of Thrones. Yeah, right? it's like, Game of Thrones. You have like all these like deep like uh, conspiracies. Yeah, 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 and I I uh, recommend you to look up Mamluk on YouTube. When you started, and when I started my PhD, I did it once on YouTube, nothing popped up. Yeah. Now, there are so many YouTube channels, yeah, yeah. and they do so great analysis, even non-Muslims. But Kings in general. I think King and General is yeah, one of the best. Yeah, very yes. good one. Yeah. They, they yeah. have one on members. Yeah, just yeah. E- even the, the vizier of um, the Abbasid Khalif, Musasim, that they suspect that he was working with the Mongols, uh, that he had, he had a Shi'i background, and that he was uh, secretly had deals that he had made yeah. with the with the Mongols yeah. and was w- working to topple the government from within. Yeah, they, the craziest all stories kinds of different. on this are with the assassins. Yeah, yeah, the assassins are a whole yes. other. Yeah, the, the assassin, assassin was something yeah. crazy. They, 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 <laughs> you could you could make like ten Hollywood movies out of them. Yes, yeah, crazy. But you know stories. you know what's really fascinating by this though. The Hashashin was so deadly. They, they even a, a report that they even b- made it at one po- at one time. Even they left a note for the Pope on his, like on mm. his on his on his bed. Wow. And at that time, the papacy was something huge. I mean, you're talking about like the president of America. Like I mean, at that time, right? Like yes. this is a huge. And the same with Saladin Ayubi. Yeah, Ayubi too as well. But the fascinating thing is that 
<laughs> when they went to Alamut, they were completely devastated by the Mongols. The where, Mongols where Alamut again? In Iran. Iran. Okay. Iran. It's called Iran. Iran. They, North they Iran. left. North yeah. Iran. And but when the when they encountered the Mongols, they just completely wiped them. Like devastated. Yes. They never recovered from that. Yes. The Ismaili actually come from there. What happened is. 500 years later, they pop up in Iran, and he goes, "Oh, I'm the, I'm the caliph of Ismailia," and then he tries to claim that he Hassan Sabah. Yes. Yeah, and then what happened is like, the, okay, the the Shah over there gave him some, some power and said, "Okay, you can have governorship." He tries to cause a rebellion, he gets kicked out, and, and then he goes hiding again, they, and then he pops up in Afghanistan <laughs> to fight for the British like in the Afghan Soviet and the Afghan British War, the and then they got here. kicked out of there, so he comes to India, and that's how you have the modern Ismaili lineage. Yes. Oh my yes, lord! Yes, and these sects, you you gotta know. I'm also, but just uh, wrapping up on 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 the Mamluks. Mamluks yes, sir. And then I come to the sects in America. So uh, one, so so the takeaway of his collation with Burke Khan is he knew he was Muslim babers. He was not perfect, also, but he was m far more Muslim than Burke Khan. Sure. So uh, 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 theologically speaking, but he knew to get him on his side would bring a great benefit to isolate the Mongols. And this is eventually how the uh, Mongols got wiped off from the from the uh, from Iran, from the Arabic Peninsula, the, 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 the places they got from Iraq, okay, and, and the remaining places they had in, in, in the Mediterranean. This is how they wiped them off. But Babers and Burke Khan making this collation, which remained for two hundred years after them. Mm. Okay. So what what is the takeaway from this? With the uh, Palestine situation now, we see some Muslims like, I don't want to say haram policing, but <laughs> they, are, they, are, they are very, very like um, critical. And negative. Negative. Why is he aligning with us? We don't want him. Yeah. I don't think that's a good thing to do because, you know, the Palestine issue, it's, it's such a clear issue of injustice. There's no clear issue of injustice now in politics going on mm. for so many decades now. And it's it's more than just a Arab or Muslim issue. It's a human issue. Yeah. If we if we restrict it and 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 uh, yeah, yani, no yeah, shrink. If we shrink it to 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 just a Muslim thing, we don't do it justice. Yeah. Let's give it give it the, the 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 value it has. It's a human dilemma now, and we have to get everybody in, just to speaking out against this injustice. That's it. It's not more than that. Why no. why not? What not? Why not welcome people uh, uh, in this? I don't get it. Yeah. So 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 that's what what I take away. So you, you you're telling me you see that um, we accept that people are not perfect. So you see it as being politically pragmatic, meaning that if you have to make some concessions um, with, like, like, like for example, Muzaffar made with, I mean, Babers made with, with Barke Khan, yes. then the greater good is that, okay, well, um, this will benefit the Muslims. But I, I would push back a little bit and say, what about to those who push back and say, well, you know, that's a risk, it's a gamble. Like, what if Burke Khan takes power and their version of, of Mongol Islam, like Tangriism, comes in and destroys <laughs> everything, right? Now, now you've lost everything. What did you say? Tangriism? Tangri is what they that, believe that's in. Their, that's their belief. Yeah. yeah. They believe in, like, this idea. So, it, I mean, I think it's, I think it, it, it's possible, and, I, and we've seen it happen before, where you know, where, where, where leaders have were politically astute and they were able to navigate that. But it takes a strong character, and I think the difference. I think this is what I what I learned from this, is despite all the things that were happening and the desire for power and the interwars that were happening between the the Muslims, there was there was a common goal that they prioritized the interests of the Muslims, number one. Like meaning that if they got power, cool, fine. But if if it came to the threat of the Muslims, they drop, they put their desire for power on the back burner. Like no, first we have to protect the name of Islam, and then we can go forward. And now I think we've lost that. Where it's like, like if you look at certain governments in the world, they want to protect their interests, but yes. they're they're just totally dropping the idea of Islam. Mm. Yes, right. And that was the, de the, the what I see here. Like I see that you know, for example, he may not have wanted to 
do certain things, but like, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna fight if 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 Muzaffar's gonna go fight against these Mongols who are gonna take away Islam, even though I want power, I'm gonna fight with them. Because this is just what it was. And this goes back to the same mentality of what Muawiyah said to Ali, right? Mm -hmm. If if you Byzantine Romans come in, I will come and take you out first. With my cousin. With, with my, exactly. Allah my family. The idea of, hey, my power, this is my inter-family beef. You don't have a say in this. Yes. Right? So, and yeah. we have to, yes. our priority is the Muslims first. That's the difference, yeah. And also, you, you don't have uh, nationalism, which, yeah. Yeah, which is a cancer. It is. Befalling the Muslim ummah. There, there are differences. I get that, and I don't want to say something specific with that. But that's the takeaway. But it's something to think about. Yeah, yeah. It's something Definitely. to think about. Definitely. And I see some resemblance, resemblances, although there are a lot of differences. And yeah, so he he he, he did a lot of stuff. He he had this um, like uh, communication system. Babers, you're talking about. Yeah, Babers, mm -hmm. which is the barit. Till this day, we 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 postal postage and yeah, mailing po service. Yeah, the mailing service in Arabic we, we call it the barit, yeah. and barit is even not the Arabic word to start with. It is the Persian word. Persian word. Yeah. Yes, yeah. because uh, buridan in Persian means cutting, mm. cutting, and uh, uh, what they would do, they had this uh, uh, rapid horses who would like. What do horses do? They don't run. Gallop. Gallop, yeah. like far distances in a short amount of time. And in order to rec recognize them as such, they would cut their tail, their tail and they had short tails. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how you rec recognize this postal uh, horses. That's crazy. And Amazing, through cutting man. their tails. And yeah. that's why it's called barit, because their tails are buride. Okay. It's cut. Pardon my ignorance, but why? What does cutting the tail have to do with any of this? I know. No, that just, it just to re the name of the male horse. Okay, this this yeah. horse, he's on a mission. Okay. He, he's no, meaning the, that identify, he's the male horse. instead of wearing like a jacket or something, yeah. or whatever, this was a sign that this horse was a male horse. Yeah, he's the male horse. And what happened is uh, they they established a communication way between Cairo and Damascus, which is the most important. Mm -hmm. And uh, mail would go there from Cairo to. Damascus within three days. Wow! This is this is like this is like the Baghdad uh, train, you know. But I think Baghdad train uh, it was like two and a half days. Wow. <laughs> it's a so, bit so more than than. By the, the way, this is important system. because if anyone who knows anything about ruling, information is power. Yes. Yeah. If you cannot communicate to your empire, you're in trouble. Because you, you can't alert them of things that are happening, right? That communication that a caliph or leader needs to have between different provinces. And this is where the idea of the caravanzis came up as well, too. They would stop. There would be designated posts where, okay, they can even from one caravan, they could, de they could dispatch to other areas. Like other other wow. neighboring areas, this right? It was a network of like a postal system. But it was also an alert system. It was like an SOS. Hey, we have something going on. We need help. Yeah, I know we are over time, but there's one thing I would like to keep please. going. We're, I, I just we're we're not going. going yeah, by, we're, not we're not going by the regular time anymore. Okay. Yeah, so we're we're take yeah. our time. Yeah, take yeah, your you time take and your time. just say everything you. I you have no say. appointments, as you know. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> yeah. okay. So we're we're, we're going to take there, it out. There's we're one drag thing it out. I, I want I want to drag the whole uh, discussion to our modern times. Yeah, okay. because I hate speaking about history as if it's something that is mm. gone and has nothing. To do not just taking like uh, takeaways, no, actually the the influence of history of our daily life today. So we spoke about the sects, right? Like the Fatimids, like the Ismailis. Yeah. And mashallah, you 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 jump to the to the colonial time. So I think these these sects they are a byproduct of. Every religion, so you have sex in you, Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. Islam, Islam is also run by Muslims. Muslims are not perfect, as we as we discussed. So you will have sects, okay? And these sects, some of them, they didn't gain power, or they lost their power, or they were fighting with 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 Sunnis, with with the main Muslim body. So what happened is, when colonialism came. They saw this as an opportunity. Okay, we can align with those guys. <laughs> they will help us out. And they can do stuff we can't. They look Muslim. 
<laughs> okay. Mm. And I, I saw, uh, I don't know which episode this was, it's with the brother from the Ahmadi community. Who oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, a cu- yeah. couple episodes. Ahmad Bashir. Ahmad. Mashallah. Mashallah. Yeah. I, I listened to the episode. I liked it very much. He, he did a good job. And I want to re emphasize on what he, what he spoke about. So the Ahmadi uh, said. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, yeah. Yeah, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Uh, or Aqai, or the Ismailis and the Baha'is, all these sects, okay, especially from Iran, from India. So, and these were places where you always had tangents with the Sunnis and the, and the Caliphate and, and, and stuff. In these places, especially the British, they, they, they saw the, the potential these sects have to maintain their power in the region. But also, also to, how do you say it? Um, when Muslims started moving to Europe and to America to influence the Islam that is lived in Europe and in America into this direction, mm. into this. To, to prop them up. Yeah, prop them up. As the representation of true Islam. In that true region. Islam. And right. you, you always see that. In, in Germany, it's very obvious. So you, you have Ahmadiyya ads on uh, metro stations and stuff <laughs> although muslims don't get to that places okay <laughs> it's it's very obvious okay and uh, so some days ago i saw on youtube the ma- the main uh, the leader of the of the main right wing party <laughs> the rfd he stepped out of the party but he's still very right wing interviewed by by, by an Ahmadi guy and <laughs> and then he revealed yeah you 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 invited me to to the Ramadan and uh, we, we know each other for years and stuff wow yes so uh, they were like uh, it's political allyship yeah pro- political allyship yeah. because they know we don't like them <laughs> so they they don't they need to like them mm. the far right the, 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 there has to be something good about those guys if Muslims don't like them. You, you know how I look at this too? I look at like, I'm sure you know of that guy, Imam Tawhidi in, uh, yeah, in the UK, in yeah. Australia. Oh, no, good, like, okay. basically, his whole gripe starts off with saying, okay, he's very much anti-Sunni. Imam, so, Imam so, Tawshirki. Yeah, Tawshirki, <laughs> yeah. And he comes out, but he's like, oh, you know it's written in Bukhari? You know it's written in Muslim? He'll never speak about the Shayu until later on when they started calling. What happened was that they uncovered the same right-wingers uncovered his videos of his, of his last media like, of him Amatam, like, beating himself with the swords and stuff and, like blood coming out he goes okay okay I'm not part of the show anymore he's like I'm, I got kicked out of the house they didn't like me I'm against that Iran I'm against them too and he changes the tune he's a total scum. yeah he's a total but what I'm saying is that they see him as a useful guy because he calls himself the imam of peace they like, see this is the real Muslim that we can have in the west if you want to be a Muslim like Tawhidi or Tawshirki you can be like him and then this is the kind of western Islam that we want and he does he goes around to India saying I don't know why Pakistan had to be created these people were just rebellious like, he just <laughs> but, looked but, but, every but, narrative yeah but let me tell you something so we said uh, m- uh, history works in mysterious ways right yeah. and Allah is the best planner so what happened and you guess told you about this the Ahmadis they sent a delegation here to America so did the Baha'is and they came here to your place and they spoke with the African American community here, and this is how all this uh, Moran Temple and the Nation of Islam and Drew Ali and all of this and and, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad <laughs> for, for all of this happened. Okay, and what happened after that? Hmm. What happened after that? After that, you had Malcolm X, you had Muhammad Ali. You had uh, Warif al-Din, the oh. son of Elijah Muhammad, who converted the whole movement to Sunni Islam again. Oh. So what I want to emphasize with this with this notion is, yeah, sometimes things go wrong, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes care also. Yeah. You see? And things come back. That's, this is what I m- mean with the comeback religion. Islam is the comeback religion. Yes, sir. It comes back to its right direction. With the comeback kids. Yeah, so never lose <laughs> hope. Okay? And and uh, for me, the African-American experience with Islam is huge. But You, you know, can I, learn I, so much of it. Although it began with this this stupid uh, Ahmadi guy who, 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 who told fairy tales. Yeah. 
Hey, he, he's really. If you, if you see, I, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Just read what he says about knocking on people's doors in in Detroit and Chicago, and what the, he told African Americans. So, what? Why is Malcolm X? Uh, what? Why is his name uh, Al Haj Malik Shabazz? Because he told them, all of you are from one tribe. Which tribe does, Shabazz. <laughs> yeah, the tribe Shabazz, yeah. which is from Arabia. Yeah. Not from Africa. Yeah. It's from Arabia, Mecca. Okay? Sorry. Uh, it is from Arabia, Mecca, the tribe Shabazz. And somehow you all ended up here and you're all Muslim. And Islam is something we wouldn't recognize as Islam. But it was just the ignorance, okay, that he... Uh, made uh, advantage of but even though this guy was such a scum and it was all sorry bt he was talking yeah but look what was what came out of it just 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 take maker max yeah. yeah just take this one person but i, I, I want to add one thing to one one more dynamic to the story and i think it's important to note this too It wasn't, that wasn't the first experience of African Americans and Muslims in America. There were Muslims here before. Yes. And Allah sent them here. But some of them came as in slaves, right? And what a calamity that was for them. Some of them were, 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 were rulers of empires, princes yes. that had knowledge of Arabic and language and they were literate. They were uh, in empires. I mean, they were living very nice. And they suffered the calamity of being captured and, and put in slaves. And slowly, so there were Muslim populations yes. in America. Mm -hmm. Even we have like some of the um, the uh, the guy who's known as the Moroccan, but he was a Dutch man who started who, who came to Manhattan, which was a Dutch colony at that time, and he establishes Islam in that area. They used to know him as the guy that walk around with the Quran in his hand. He was a Dutch convert. Okay, yes. but and but back in the day, he married a Moroccan woman at that time, and then and the at that time it was like the uh, Mauritanian Empire that was what it was known as, right? Maghreb was the area, and so he had sons. He sent them out to America to invest. He was a wealthy businessman. He invested in Manhattan. He built certain areas. He would walk around with a with a with a with a Quran and stuff, and they would know him at that. But what happened is their Islam became more of an of identity. They kind of lost it. There were no massages, right? Even, I'm talking about the African-Americans that came here where they were brought in enslaved, but then Allah kept that spark in them. So when people like, you know, these Ahmadis come by and they come with these different ideas, it reignites that spark. It's, oh yeah, you are from, you have a connection to Arabia. You have a connection to this place. And that kind of gets them thinking. And then you have someone who Allah sent as a mujaddid for them to revive them like Malcolm X. So what I'm saying is that There was Islam here before. This goes back to even before, like America was even established. There were black African Moors, I mean, or, or from the from the empire that were trading with natives in America. We know that. We know that we're here. They established trade routes. Actually, there's a, there's a popular the, thought that believes that uh, Musa Mensa, his his, his brother, brother yes. actually left to come to America and yes. never returned, and that's how he became the yes. the, yeah, the leader in wow. Mali. That's well established. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is that, but mm. how Allah makes this happen, right? He he he's maybe he's used this buffoon, the Qadianis, to reignite that spark, yeah. and then he sends people like Malcolm X to Allah totally Allah. rebring them back in. Subhanallah. Yeah. Wow. So ne never lose hope. And also look into history. Look in, in, into the Muslim roots of the place you are from. Even in America, even in Europe, if you look into history, you will find Muslims. And this is very important to the identity building, you know. And uh, I can tell you one thing. Uh, maybe that's the last thing for me. Uh, that Muslims in Europe look up to Muslims in America. Why? I tell you why. <laughs> I tell you why. Why? I, I tell you why. Because Islam somehow has a legacy here. So you, you spoke about the slaves. That's far back. I'm sure you... Did you have uh, Imam Abdul Hakim Quick here? Not no, yet. We, we had hope a, to. We had the brother who was the Imam of... Uh, uh, the Masjid the that, that, that... Masjid Fatir. Yeah. Uh, that Muhammad Ali made. Muhammad Ali so we have okay. the grandson of uh, Warthi Muhammad. MashaAllah. No, Elijah Muhammad, right? Uh, his his the brother son was of Herbert. No, 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 no. Um, he his brother was okay. Herbert, who was the son of Elijah. Elijah, okay. Yeah, okay. so his his wow. son, yeah, he became the Imam of he still is of the Masjid al Fatih in okay. the south side, which is the one that Muhammad Ali built, built away from the nation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. So I've you were saying, as far as um, you just 
you were saying, talking about look into the history of where you come from. Yeah, where you come yeah. from. So and mo- and uh, the Europeans looking at the yes. Muslim community. Yeah, Muslim yeah, community. yeah. Why? Because uh, yeah, uh, Imam Abdul Hakim Quick he, spe- he speaks a lot about this, and it's also his uh, research. Uh, of the Native Americans and everything. Yeah, yeah. So there were a lot of uh, revolutions uh, f- uh, led by slaves, which are uh, Islamically inspired, especially in Brazil. Okay, they had a whole like mini empire, and they would fight against the slaveholders. Really? Yes, and uh, also in all Central America, and also. Here, here you, you didn't have the revolution, but you had individuals uh, who kept the identity and they would write Quran and they had Quran memorized and they would speak Arabic. And there was one guy, I, I forgot his name, he's, he's very famous. They, yes, I forgot the name, but they he actually... He pretended to be Christian. Yeah, he actually... They, they oh, Saeed, the, the yes, guy. Yes. Saeed and he wrote on the walls, yeah, yeah, yeah. like these pagans want to make this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> they, they, they told him, write the uh, Lord's Prayer down, <laughs> and he wrote the Fatha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so obviously he, he, he just pretended. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is, and also this long history of, 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 of the nation also, okay, uh, which eventually then found its way, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, for me, African-American Islam is so important and profound because it influenced the general discourse on the civil rights movement. You know, the civil rights movement is a huge thing in history. People in 500 years are going to remember the civil rights movement, are going to speak about it. Yeah. And this whole movement was influenced by Muslim figures be it athletes, be it uh, uh, speakers, okay? And this is something we don't have in Europe. In Europe, oh. we, we didn't have such thing. We didn't have a Muhammad Ali in Europe. That's true. You see? So that's, that's one thing. The, 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 the second thing is, as I told you, you are more established, okay? You speak English. If I speak German, who cares? Okay? You speak the language of the world. But it sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> German sounds good. Yeah, say something in German right now. <laughs> say something about German. I swear. I feel like I'm listening to like Arnold Schwarzenegger sometimes. <laughs> you know, actually, but Arnold Schwarzenegger, you, all he's Americans Austrian. Get, he's, he's Austrian. Austrian. Yeah, he, yeah, has, he has a deep Austrian accent. But you're also. Austrian Germany, you know. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's yeah, not yeah, the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's, like, it's like saying... Uh, uh, American Canada, right? Indian Pakistan. Like, like a ch- Chicago <laughs> accent and Texas accent. Oh, okay. Is, all right, the same. Yeah. is it the same? No. It's no. not. So, yeah, there's a difference. But anyway, so so guys look up to you. So I just want you to know which responsibility you have, okay? You, you al- Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you to this place here. You uh, don't lack anything. You are doing well. You're speaking the, the language of the world. You have all things that you need to have access. Uh, so uh, take benefit of that. That's that's my message to the Muslim community in, in America. Don't let them you know, I think one benefit we have here, I'll tell you what I see, is that we still have a lot of freedoms that other European places do yes, not sir. have. And uh, this is just purely by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Majority of Muslims that came here are from well-established backgrounds because America had a criteria, right? A lot of people that were absorbed into Europe either came by colonialization, I mean, they get, they were granted from the Commonwealth a passport, and they simply created. The, yeah, they have a huge population, but they're confined within certain areas, and they never really came beyond that. And then, in order to come out of that, they had to bend the knee, right? Like, for example, look at all the politicians that are in in um, in, in Europe or UK, whatever it may be, right? They they have a very different attitude, yes. right? <laughs> But if you maintain your Islam, well, you're going to be kind of down here, right? Whereas we have an opportunity in America to be uniquely American and learn from that experience, right? We should learn from the people that came before us because they have a head start. People, Muslims in Europe have like a hundred year head start over us, right? But we should learn that, hey, what happens when you try to bend the knee? You lose your identity. We have now a chance to do something entirely unique, especially now where it's in turmoil. They don't know society is in chaos now. They are looking to, for example, in Michigan where they see Muslim parents standing up to the LGBTQ thing while... Christian conservatives can't do that. They're looking at Muslims to do that. You have American right wing, whether we agree with them or not, but they're highlighting benefits of Islamic ideas and saying, look, they got it right. 
The conservatives are hypocrites. They're calling for the things that Muslims actually do, but they want to hate the Muslims. You know, you, you know, there's a Muslim convert in, in, in Holland who was in the party of Geert Wilders, and he knows all these right-wing politicians. Joram van Klaveren. Yes. We did an interview. We had an interview with ah, him. Ah, mashallah. Yeah. You know what he says in one of his podcasts? He's, he knows those guys personally. Not, and, and, and I noticed that also in Germany and in places I know these party figures. None of them has children. And all of them emphasis, we are getting... Birth rates. The birth rates <laughs> and we are getting overrun. And By it's, 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 it's yeah. the... the How do you call it? The overturning. The majority. Overturning. The majority is the, changing. It's flipping. Yeah, yeah, flipping, and yeah. that changing the population, population, and so on. Okay, get children. <laughs> <laughs> get start to work. Start having <laughs> sex. They're, yeah, they're, they're hypocrites. They're gonna start adopting polygamy now because they need to have more children, <laughs> right? See, Islam got it right again, <laughs> right? No, but I mean, coming back to your point though, um, about black liberation, it's super important. I think Muslims uh, uh, who are not black and not African American overlook this yeah. and we yes. all we are indebted to the african-american community in america for yes. a lot a lot of the groundwork they laid allowed our ancestors to migrate here with ease yeah, right because the true. groundwork was done and a lot of the people who were part of the black liberation movement actually ended up becoming muslim for example we did an interview with the son of h rap brown yes right who was a figure like i mean as par or with marcus garvey i mean like meaning the fbi was watching him and and he's right now incarcerated still right but these are I mean, Jamal, I mean, yes. yeah and they came out of black liberation and it was influenced by the idea that hey you know we don't need to be bound to the idea that they put on us we have an identity that came before this and it can you know and And even if they weren't from the identity, they adopted something which recognizes their autonomy, their rights, and they knew they found it within Islam. Mm. And they very much made it their own experience in America, and they've continued that. And because of that, like I remember my uncle, I mean, he passed away now, but he used to have the first Hajj group from America. He took Malcolm X on Hajj, right? Oh, and, oh. I mean, these, these are things that you, you see about, like, I mean, you hear about, right? And you're like, oh man, but how would he have had that opportunity if it wasn't for Malcolm X? Yes. Yeah. How You're would right. you have had that opportunity? You're right. You're right. We totally. wouldn't have had it, right? I mean, a lot of these organizations, these, uh, like we went to Baltimore uh, recently for the ICNA conference, and we got to see like the first main centers. We talked to early like um, grassroots community members that have been in that community for 50, 60 years. Wow. Before most people even came to America, right? And they've been putting the work in doing the grassroots stuff, not just talking about Islam in the masjid, but finding ways to fund the the needy people there bring education bring health care make Islam while, a social force yes you know? exactly the, mm. the, 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 the principles right the action items right the amal that Islam brings after you make your tash, you know your shahad the, the amal that they have to they've, they've put the work in and it's all there you just have to uh, take advantage of what is in Islam but you know? without the excluding them and, with, and, and without uh, 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 neglecting the fact that they brought it right yes. a lot of times what happens is communities come in and they end up just kind of taking over because they feel like they're more educated or they're they have more money but they have to recognize that there are pioneers that came before and we know what the quran says about that right Al-awalun, these are people who came before you they're more they're more beloved in the sight of allah because of the work they put in yeah. it's harder for them there's an academic he uh, speaks a lot about this maybe you, you get him one day sherman jackson Oh, yeah, Sherman, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he complains about happen. this, and yeah. rightfully right, so, rightfully yeah. so. Yeah, you ha you have to give your flowers and build on that. Yeah, inshallah. 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 Right, brothers, um, make sure you guys uh, click on the old like button, hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Uh, throw a comment in the comment section, um, brother Arash. It's um, check out check out the Mizan way. Yeah, I thought I called his name wrong again. M I V A A N. Double A. It's double A. Double A. Double A. Yeah. And and what what kind of content are you putting on there again? So I put my sports content, motivational speaking, just to uplift the youth. They can have an athletic body. They can practice their religion. There's you don't have to look. Like a sheikh, just, <laughs> yeah. just I just followed right now. Yeah, yeah. just just. Are, are you a MMA, are an MMA fan? Uh, I've considered going into. No, I mean, do, do you, you watch, watch UFC? UFC? Uh, yeah, I watch, but 
I'm not so much the big sports Ooh. watcher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but, but I think Morty's invited. He's a, I know well. about. He's a doer. That's no, right. Yeah, we're, 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 we're gonna have you over and. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna invite you to my house to watch the UFC event. You'll watch a true American UFC event. This is America now. Yeah, <laughs> we can have, do a fighting event some, someday, inshallah. <laughs> but you can watch UFC with me tonight. I'm saying. Okay. I don't want to fight I, you, brother. I want to invite you. Okay, not okay, fight okay. you. <laughs> tonight, tonight we watch and later, inshallah. I'm too old to fight now. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're humble. <laughs> all right brothers uh thank you all for listening all you guys in the chat who've been watching please throw a comment in the comment section it really helps the algorithm and helps the uh channel grow um when you guys put it in the chat it doesn't really care about that when you throw it in the comment section it, that's what matters Wait, let me check um, the that's likes. what helps us out make yeah. sure you hit the like button throw the likes man already. we got germany, yeah, guys, we got germany have, helping wait, us hold out on one second we have 40 i think five people and we only have 20 30, oh, 30 like okay there we go. it's coming up that's oh, a good, good ratio good 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 ratio guys Keep, right. the rest of you hit the yeah. like button hit the like button thank you all for sticking around we'll see y'all next time assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum